Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being at the Public Safety Committee meeting. We are going to begin with a change to the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda today is going to be circuit court. That's going to be followed by the Outdoor Firearms Training Center, then the Public Safety Communication Center, and the Second District Police Station. Um, and then we're we'll getting to the police uh, issues. Uh, the the first one, circuit court, and and the uh, the uh, others should not be nearly as long as the uh, public safe as the uh, pub police uh, uh, discussion. And with that, we'd like to welcome uh, Judge Bonifant and his and, and everyone who's with him. And uh, unless the committee has anything to begin, I'm going to ask Ms. Farag, who was once again done a marvelous job for creating this uh, uh, packet to, uh, to lead us through, please. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the circuit court budget recommended this year is a same services budget. Uh, the court continues to address caseloads post-COVID. They have a backlog that they are still currently addressing. There's about a $1.1 million increase in the budget this year, and I can go through those through the packet for you. I didn't know if you wanted um, to give the judge any opportunity for opening statements first, but I'm happy to go in wh whichever order you prefer. Well, I would, if Your Honor, if you have any opening statements, please. Katz, thank you for. You need to turn when you're, there you thank go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Katz, Ms. Mink, Ms. Lute, thank you for having us today. I really want to introduce to the council our new court administrator, Tim Sheridan. Uh, is born in Montgomery County, so he's coming home after a career in Anne Arundel County. He served as the court administrator in Baltimore County Circuit Court and joined us last year, probably about October. Is, is that right? So? Yes. <laughs> I'm also joined today by the deputy court administrator, Kara Hawkins, who's been with the court for many years, so 11 years. So uh, Ms. Hawkins was my uh, judicial assistant when I first joined the bench and then uh, served as the acting court administrator uh, while we were in the search and found Mr. Sheridan. Uh, the budget you see is, uh, as was just stated, uh, we're maintaining things. I, uh, I, every time I get a chance to speak now publicly, which is often, I do uh, discuss the backlogs that we have, uh, and they are substantial. The last uh, count we had, we had over a thousand open criminal matters in the county. That's about 300 more than we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the other types of cases that I give priority to are custody cases. And right now we have approximately 1,800 open custody cases in the court. And that's nearly 600 more than we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I am extremely proud of our bench. I'm extremely proud of of the staff that we have at the court. Uh, I worry that everybody is working too hard um, because every decision we make is, you start with this thought, how can we put a judge in the best possible position to make the best possible decision? And then you go from there. And uh, it's, it's been challenging. It wasn't only just the pandemic. In all of 2021, we were down four judges. We were supposed to have 24. We only had 20. And the governor uh, then appointed, and, and then the uh, electorate uh, confirmed uh, the election of four new judges, and uh, we're very pleased with them. Uh, the other is the introduction of MDEC, which is a new electronic filing system in the court. So everybody's job is the same, but you have a new way that you're required to do it, and it takes time. And if you've ever been involved going from a paper system to a paperless system, it takes a while. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, I'm very pleased. Um, uh, the three of us have been looking at the projections over the next couple of years. We rely upon the National Center for State Courts. Mm -hmm. I did, I got Great. it. Yeah. Uh, and they're projecting that our caseloads will increase over the next couple of years. So uh, please keep that in mind. I know we're here on the operating budget as well, but also I'll put a plug in now. The, the North Tower of the Circuit Court uh, is going to need to be refurbished. And uh, I, uh, we're starting to work on plans with regard to that as well. 
And uh, then if you want to say something with regard to that, that'd be good. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back in Montgomery County. The, uh, as the judge mentioned, we do have some, the, the North Tower, I believe, was built in 1980, and it just has some age is issues. I would say the most alarming one is it's really an, an access issue for persons in wheelchairs in the courtrooms, in the jury rooms particularly, in the jury deliberation rooms, and in the jury deliberation restrooms. And, and it's just, uh, and, and in the witness boxes as well, and the jury boxes. So it's the, the people that are coming here to help to do their duty, to do their service, and we really need to look into that. And we'll, we'll, we'll put in a, in the capital improvement uh, budget, we'll put in a full uh, outline of that. And, and going with that also, there's an issue of judicial security in the North Tower as opposed to the South Tower, and there is an issue of IT infrastructure. One of our great gains that we've done and learned, learned in the pandemic was how to re do remote hearings. And we've gotten really good at it, and the, the bar and the litigants have ad uh, adapted to it. But our internal infrastructure is not able to keep up with it. So while we are doing very well with remote hearings, particularly in things like uncontested divorces, we can roll through those without in inconveniencing the, the, the public. But we will, we will need some help in both our North Tower and South Tower on those. And, and that's uh, really what I wanted to say to the council other than thank you and it's great Thank to you and here. welcome. Can I make one other comment? Please, please Your Honor. Honor. Uh, one of the uh, things that we're very pleased as a bench in the court is that the pre-release center is reopening yeah, and this other week, I think. Yeah, this week and that has uh, caused some opportunities to succeed I use that phrase instead of challenge all the time and one of it is has been working with the sheriff's department and working with the Department of Corrections because many of the <clears throat> uh, individuals working at the jail were serving as coordinators for the Zoom hearings, and we were having so many Zoom hearings. Well, they're now going to the PRC and going back to work, so we've heard that they wanted a reduction in the number of Zoom hearings that we were doing. And the sheriff, uh, of course, they're down in terms of deputies right now. They would ha like to have as many Zoom hearings as possible. Working with those two organizations over the last two months to work out what's going to be the best uh, plan going forward has been terrific it really has and we've come up with a strategy now as to how we're going to address that and uh, I just I told him in our last meeting yesterday I said this has been great I've enjoyed it and I'm going to say something at the hearing today in front of the three of you so uh, I'm fulfilling my promise so. thank you when you were talking about the improvements to the courthouse the building itself Dave Dice who's sitting right Jesus. behind his head did pop up yeah. so uh, <laughs> We went through the building one time. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, with that, and and I, Mr. Harrigan, is that? Yes, yeah, and you, if you would like to please introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Councilman Katz. Uh, Derek Harrigan, the Office of Management and Budget. Very good. Thank you very much. And did you have anything to add or no? Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Ms. Frog, we're going to begin, please. I'm just, I'm going to go through a couple of the recommended changes in the executive's budget before we get to the vacancy, so it's a little bit out of order in the packet, but on page three, um, the first increase they have is increasing service reimbursement fees for jury service. Um, that was actually due to an increase uh, by state law that increased the service stipend from $15 to $30 per day for the first five days of a trial. These payments are, however, reimbursable by the state. The second one is an adjustment to the family division services for 185,000, um, and it has grant funding for 45,000. This reflects the inc um, procedural change implemented by the judge, which diverts every family case sent to facilitation and mediation. It allows each family case the opportunity to settle in part or entirety of their cases. Um, the 0.37 FTE is general funds, and the 0.63 FTE is grant funds, and that reflects the court mediator position. And the court has advised that the position has been extremely helpful and has been mediating in real time with the parties in the courtroom. The elimination of one-time items approved is a uh, reduction of $250,000. Those are just one-time items that were added last year, and that includes the purchase of new ransomware prevention software and upgrading some audiovisual equipment in several of the courtrooms. In terms of the Mar Maryland Electronic Court Case Management System update, um, that was a project created to uh, a system-wide case management system for all of the courts in the state. 
and now courts are able to access complete records instantly as cases travel from district court to circuit court as well as to the appellate courts. Um, Montgomery County was the last jurisdiction to integrate with the MDEC. We had very complicated multi-data feeds that had to be integrated into that system. There were several technical delays as well as COVID-related delays, but the court system is now fully integrated with the statewide case management system. After struggling with full implementation for several years, the court has advised that MDEC integration is going well. The court's currently working on providing staff with business processes to align with the court's new case management system. Flipping back to vacancies on page three, um, the council requested a vacancy run um, from the executive for every single department. And this is current as of March of this year. The current, um, the court at that time had 13 vacant positions, of which nine are budgeted. The recommended lapse for this year will be $348,000. It's approximately a third of the budgeted vacancies. Um, this lapse represents historical planning lapse, and I point that out because OMB has used a couple of different new types of lapse, too. Um, that is not in play in the circuit court's budget this year. Um, I have not gone through these in any sufficient length to recommend if any are opportunities for reductions. I didn't know if any of the committee members had questions about them, something that I could help follow up on um, if you're interested in examining any of these for the moment. For any of the vacancies that are currently, how long have they been vacant? Do you know off the top of your head? Well, a lot, I mean, I'm looking at the list now, and a, a lot of them are, are positions that we've reworked into different positions. And so I see, I'm looking at the case manager position and the, the mediator position. Those those ones have been eliminated, I believe. So the media, so the top in the top, uh, if you're looking at the same page, I'm looking at have been eliminated. The, um, the senior court researcher will be refilled shortly, and so it, it, it has been open for several months. The juvenile social worker is a new position that we got from the state, so the only new position in our uh, uh, budget request is actually state funded, and, and that's come in. And um, so no, I think the rest of them are all either in the process of being filled other than the top three mediator positions the court evaluator that's been a position that seems to have yeah. remained open for a while. Yeah, we've had a, a, a lot of trouble filling, uh, uh, but it's also funded by the, the Family Services Grant, a lot of trouble filling uh, uh, court evaluators. They, they assess custody cases mm -hmm. and, and they're social workers and require a certain licensure. And we've had a very difficult time retaining and attracting that group of workers. And so they have been open for an unusually long amount of time. And we had probably last year a very unusually high lapse or turnover, as we call it, just because a lot of positions were open, including mine, for a period of time, and uh, so and uh, assignment director. So we had some high-end positions that were open. We have now filled those, and we're sort of getting our hands wrapped around our problems. And it, uh, the state has really leaned in, too, with the assistance of senior judges, we're, which is on their dime as well, but we've really advance the resources we're throwing at the, at the issues that are in front of us and still having a difficult time. But to answer your question, other than those three mediator positions, no, they all will be filled. Mr. Sheridan has touched on a couple of the strategies that we've been... Touch your... Yeah. Oh. These, thank you. On these uh, backlogs, one is to rely upon our senior judges more often. And uh, I'm part of a statewide committee through the judiciary now to come up with best practices as to how to utilize the senior judges. And that, that report will be coming out in the next two months. We're already implementing them here in Montgomery County. The other is the uh, appointment of the full-time family mediator. And uh, when cases have to be postponed, I give priority to the criminal cases and custody cases. And we overbook because so many of them settle at the last minute. And all cases have to come in front of me uh, before they can be postponed. And I will, at times, go off the record and talk to the litigants to see what can we do. Can we settle everything, or can we settle this issue, that issue, make sure that the child is seeing both parents in an appropriate uh, manner? Uh, and I'm successful sometimes. Other times I'll bring in this new uh, case uh, mediator, court mediator, and she's been very success successful. I, it's running about 40% of the cases we send to her that get settled, and that's huge. But that's a reflection of how many cases are coming in uh, with regard to custody issues into the court right now. 
it's uh, overall the family uh, side of the house is more than 60 percent of our overall docket. Mm -hmm. so that's why uh, we've got a terrific family department. Um, so and the evaluators are so important because they can help, and particularly with cases, so many people show up, they're representing themselves or others who can't afford private evaluation. We've got evaluators in the courthouse who can go out and get that needed information. Again, going to putting the judge in the best possible position to make the best possible decision. So, Very good. I would like to re re uh, correct one thing. Uh, Montgomery County was not the last jurisdiction in the state. Prince George's came in uh, about a year after we did with regard to MDEC, and I believe the plan is for Baltimore City to uh, switch over to MDEC in a year. 2024. 2024. So. Well, we were moving pretty slow that we thought we were going to come in last. But, uh, <laughs> and we've that had this discussion, fact. as you know, Your Honor, many, many times, but we're glad that you're where you need to be at this point or close to where you need to be. Anything else, Ms. Farrell? Um, so the council is handling reconciliation lists differently this year. The committee's placing all tax-supported increases of the executive's recommended budget on the reconciliation list, and committees are expected to recommend items either be prior prioritized as high priority or priority. Um, and if the committees choose not to fund specific items, those reductions are also placed on the reconciliation list. So I've just put out a recommend reconciliation list for your consideration, and that is just placing the two items um, that are increasing on the reconciliation list as high priority items. Other things like compensation are being handled separately through the collective bargaining agreement, that type of thing. And there are other built-in costs that are just every annual, their annual costs that don't really change. So well, I'm fine with high priority. I don't know about the other yeah, committee. I did have a couple questions Please. I just wanted to ask. So I was very excited when you finally got MDEC. Um, I know that was a long, a long, long journey. Um, and, and candidly, I had, spent five years using the file, LexisNexis file and serve with the consolidated asbestos docket years ago. And then, you know, like any new thing, going from paper to electronic is hard, but if you learned one electronic system and then you're trying to go to a new one, you're like, well, I don't like you. You're not quite like what I had before. So it causes everybody some growing pains. But in terms of having that system now, what efficiencies have you realized as a result of having um, the circuit court now integrated with MDEC? I have enjoyed that more than any other judge on the bench because uh, <laughs> I oversee all the dockets. Yeah. So I just gave an example where they have to come in front of me to get the case. Right. Uh, I'm able to go from one file to the next like that. Right. Um, and with the uh, interaction that we have with the district court where criminal cases generally start, mm -hmm. there, I can go right in to the district court file and see what happened there. So those, those are terrific. I, 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 I like it a lot. How um, how is that? Because you, you know, you mentioned especially in the family law context that a lot of the litigants are pro se litigants. And what percentage of your family law litigants would you estimate are pro se litigants? At least sixty percent. You may not remember exactly. At I least think it's sixty-five percent of uh, right. uh, litigants statewide, uh, and it's probably the same here. In, in okay. And then I'm guessing again, since they use MDEC too. Um, there's additional work or may require additional work from court staff in order to assist the pro se litigants with using the MDEC system. There is. They, they are required to go through a process to become a registered user. I forget mm -hmm. the exact mm -hmm. phrase so that they can use it, but they have to go through that process. But they are still permitted to show up and file and paper file. copies as well. Okay. So. And I don't know if anybody knows this, but how many would you say are still coming up to file in person? No. Or is that a significant? The self-represented is still significant on the paper filing, but there are, we have been ple pleasantly surprised by the, the members of the public that want to use the automatic services. So it, there is still that process. There is still the process of converting the old paper files into the, into the electronic files, which is the clerk's office is steadfastly working through, but it does present a lot of challenges and where MDEC, the, uh, as the judge extolled the virtues, it's, it's broad, it's powerful, there's mm -hmm. the files everywhere, you can get to things, you don't lose things. But there's also, Montgomery County was very sophisticated before the advent of mm -hmm. MDEC and its computer-based case management services, mm -hmm. and I know this coming from other counties, mm -hmm. and there was 
uh, frankly, uh, some loss in functionality just because it was a difficult transfer uh, to, to something that will eventually be better. But right. still in that process, and that's causing some of our internal angst, but really not slowing us down that much. And I'm assuming that many of the cases that had a lengthier prehistory file, if you will, prior to transfer to MDEC were civil filings, correct? Yes, the bigger the, the civil files are generally bigger than the criminal. And they they linger, they linger, <laughs> not for any effort on 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 your part, uh, but but civil cases tend to take a, have a longer lifespan. And it's usually five years. I came, uh, I came from Baltimore County, and we were converted to the MDEC four years ago. It's usually about about the four or five year mark where you start noticing the paper really starts to go away. We'll be living with it for another couple of years, yeah, and then it really will become a thing of the past. Because we're only a year and a half in. A year and a half in, right? Now. Okay. Another efficiency that I thought while listening is extremely important. Under Maryland law, a judge is required to review all the prior files when a domestic violence petition is filed. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that electronically now instead of sitting there and waiting for all the files to come up and mm -hmm. here in the courtroom, we can just click and go from one to the next. And it, uh, that makes a big difference. Great. Thank you. You're Thank you. Anything else? No. Anything else, Ms. Frog? No, nope, just needed to get your vote for the record. Well, and we're, and without, <laughs> without the dissent, we're going to have uh, – Approved is written and high priorities for the two mm -hmm. two items, right? Yep. yep. If I had to send, they would let me know. But anyhow, thank you. <laughs> thank you all very, very much for what you do. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like, Your Honor, we could do that. Thank you. Then we all get to hold our hand up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Next, we're going to have, as I announced earlier, the next three items are the Outdoor Firearms Training Center, the Public Safety Communication Center, Phase 2, and the second district police station, and I have a feeling that we're going to be joined by Dave Dice. And the chief. And the chief, too. All right. I don't build them just for me. <laughs> good afternoon, gentlemen and chief. It's good, good seeing you. We already said hello to Mr. Dice earlier. And, mm -hmm. Um and unless the committee has any questions, we're going to we're going to turn to you, please. Sure, I'm sure this feels like deja vu all over again. Um, the committee's already reviewed two of these. Um, there were January 15th amendments for the Outdoor Firearms Training Center and Public Safety Communication Center Phase Two. That actually was a supplemental appropriation. Uh, the second district police station is new. These all three result from the March 15th amendments that the um, county executive sent over. And he's got additional changes um, due to the reduction primarily of rec uh, recordation tax revenues um, and the need to find the capacity in the six-year expenditure schedule. So for the Outdoor Firearms Training Center, uh, which you've already reviewed once for a two-year delay, um, this new March 15th amendment pushes the project out another year, and that reduces the six-year expenditures from about $2.2 million to just about 500000 uh, when you uh, reviewed this a month or so ago, uh, you recommended approval as submitted for the January 15th amendment with the understanding that it would do an in-depth review during the full CIP next year. Um, since it's been delayed so many times, and last year council staff cautioned against further delay, and this is an additional delay that will put it out three years, the site continues to degrade. Again, overall site safety is a concern with the earth and berms. Um, as they continue to degrade, um, I'm recommending not approving this March 15th amendment for an additional year's delay on the project. Understanding, however, that it's a $2.2 million, you know, item that we're talking about, and it does, we would need to find capacity in the CIP in order to make that happen. Mr. Dice, did you have any, or, or Chief? Uh, well, no. The obviously, it's a fiscal capacity decision on the part of uh, OMB and the executive. I can simply state that the repairs that um, are outlined in the in the PDF and in the packet are certainly needed. The um, there's not enough ranges. Uh, this would expand the number of ranges and also the length of some of the ranges. The site uh, has experienced some significant. Um, not erosion, but degradation of the of the slopes are just old, and earth settles. The slopes need to be raised. 
uh, uh, there's concern about safety. Uh, the packet included an aerial photo, so it's nice to actually see that in perspective. And if uh, council members wanted to go and visit the site, I'm sure that could be arranged. But um, it definitely needs some work. Uh, some of the structures there, uh, putting in a, a pavilion and a new ammo bunker would uh, uh, certainly be warranted. But it's the capacity decisions is ultimately what's driving this matter. Thank you, Chief. Did you have anything to I, I would just concur with Mr. Dice. I mean, I think that um, the number one concern that we have is, is in regards to safety. So, um, but that everything else he said is spot on. Thank you. I, I'm concerned about the safety as well. I think we all are. And, and um, so I go along with what you're suggesting, Ms. Farag, about the, that we are not, that we don't want to hold it up another year. And I haven't, and Please, if you have anything to I add, have, uh, yeah, question actually. Um, which one am I um, yeah, you do. yeah, I just wanted to clarify if the uh, I mean, safety concern I agree, the safety concerns are, are a real thing that we want to address. Um, granted, last time we had this conversation, we did agree to a one year delay, so there is there's some wiggle room in there, and there was some understanding that there were aspects of this that were that were sustainable knowing that we would have to return to it and so just a balance of what expenses we want to make sure make it over the line this time versus versus waiting longer but um so the berms are a site safety thing the um the, the capacity range and you know expanding um is less a safe that feels like more of a something that could potentially wait um, am I understanding that correctly? Is there is there an option that we could look at where it's like we deal with the berms and we uh, the safety issues and then do, the safety issues in particular? You know, could we maybe come back to council with kind of two options or or any anything you can? That's a that's a reasonable question. Uh, the the mechanics of the construction is that you'll end up paying for the work twice. Right. Uh, if I go in and and uh, raise and reinforce the existing berms. Uh, half of those burbs will have to be torn down to expand the, the, the ranges, uh, the number of, of alleys, and then the, the depth. So some of that work will be paid for twice because of moving the dirt. Uh, could we go in and raise the berms and stabilize what's there now? Certainly, we could, uh, uh, or just do some of those structures. It doesn't address the greater and long-term training needs of the police department. But from a safety standpoint, we could do that. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm concerned in that moving dirt seems like not a big thing, but it's a big thing uh, and expensive. And, uh, and if we want to do this to last, uh, only to know that in four years we're going to come back and tear out at least half of what we did now, just doesn't seem to be very prudent uh, financially. But. That makes sense. I, if if there's a way that we can, I mean, I, it, the, the underlying words here are safety, sure. and if there's any way we can do it to be uh, to uh, maintain it that it's safe and be prudent and that you don't have to tear half of them out, well, then we'll look I into think that. we that that would be a, a good sure. suggestion. I'll I'll take that as a homework assignment. Okay, sure. Ms. Frog, please. The second item is the Public Safety Communications Center Phase 2, electrical distribution and HVAC upgrade. You've already reviewed, reviewed a supplemental amendment that added $4.8 million uh, from January, February 13th, I'm sorry. And that was needed due to cost increases related to supply chain challenges and equipment costs, and it was required to award the contract for construction in the first place. This new amendment is adding an additional $1 million to the project, again, for similar supply chain challenges and there was an additional post-bid cost increase related to the mechanical HVAC equipment. Uh, this is um, very critical infrastructure for the ECC. Those systems have to be maintained at temperature control and as well as for, for um, employee comfort and, and health, actually. So I'm recommending approval of this as submitted by the executive. It's, um, it's a tough market out there. And um, I asked my staff, I said, Please tell me I'm not going to be back in another month asking for yet another million dollars. <laughs> uh, they assure me I'm not. Uh, but these are due to market conditions. Uh, again, the project was originally estimated 
outside the uh, void of uh, knowledge uh, of what things would be. Things as they are continue to go up, hence the post-bid award and the contractor coming and saying, I just, I just can't get this stuff. With, so that's that's the need for the million dollars more. You know, no one likes to spend an extra million, but I think we need to do. Well, that. we don't want to. I mean, I, I could debate with the contractor, make him pay for it, and he could go belly up, and that would not. Yeah, that really wouldn't help <laughs> us. You know, still wouldn't get it. And, um, I was going to say, there's also the risk, if not done and moved forward and handled appropriately, of all the complex electrical and computer equipment required to run the center. Correct. Tanking, causing an additional expenditure. So right, and yeah. and with the PSCC, it's it's labeled phase two. Remember, this was not a purpose-built building. This is a building that the county bought, turned into a PSCC. So it's always been wanting in some respects. And we went in and did major critical safety and operational systems improvements under phase one. Uh, this gets to. Uh, uh, HVAC, which is a building comfort issue. You don't want your 911 operators and others uh, or equipment overheating. So uh, this is uh, was not deemed as essential as phase one, but certainly is important for the operation of the uh, of the center and employees uh, that occupy it. Okay, are we okay? Mm -hmm. We're fine. Ms. Rog, please go to the. I think the last one will be the easiest one today. Yes, absolutely. It's a. Uh, um, it's just an amendment that takes savings, about $87,000, to reflect the savings in the actual project costs. It's pending closeout. The 2D police station's been completed for years, and I'm recommending approval as submitted. All right. We'll all accept the $87,000. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else, Chief, on yours? If not, Mr. Dice, did you have anything else? I will just now that the 87000 is being collected, I have to find someplace else to fund the DGS picnic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my thought is you could build all those other projects for that 87000 Yeah. Good seeing you all. Thank you. And next, we're going to turn to uh, the police. Uh, and uh, the chief is already here. And anyone that is you know, the assistant chiefs, et cetera, please join us. Did you have any opening comments from your, your side? Sure. So uh, good Good afternoon um, to the, the committee, and thank you all for allowing us to be here today. Um, first of all, I just uh, briefly would just say that I think I'm um, very appreciative of the county executive's uh, uh, proposed budget. Um, I think it, it fits in void, and, and it will be a good discussion for us to talk about the, the needs that we have here in the department and some of the things that we're doing. Um, and also, we just wanted to extend a thank you uh, to the to the committee chair, uh, Mr. Katz, for uh, for um, your work in um, approving uh, the um, being an important figure in voting for our our union's uh, contract. So that's that's very helpful for our our department uh, with both our sworn officers and professional staff. So, thanks, Chief. The, there there will be a full council. Uh, discussion and the other council members who are not on government operations will also <laughs> certainly be able to weigh in on, on that topic. Um, and I did, I did want to uh, to welcome Mr. Phillips. I, uh, <laughs> if you wanted to please exp tell us who you are, please. Uh, Dale Phillips, uh, the budget director for the police department. Welcome again. We we have seen each other several times. And with that, unless the the committee has anything, we're going to turn back to you, Ms. Farag. Sure. Um, the recommended 24 budget for the police department is $317 million, and that's reflecting about a 7% expenditure increase. That is primarily funding compensation, and in, in fact, it also reflects a net service reduction. The department remains critically understaffed. This is impacting service delivery now, and service reduction is more likely to widen racial disparities in community safety. Um, I did a pretty extensive racial equity analysis on police department operations as far as providing public safety to the community. And the, the too long didn't read version of that basically is that police department health has an impact on community health. And what I mean by that is as they try to implement these police reform mandates with fidelity, not just rubber stamping, but making sure that they actually meet and deliver the intent of those mandates, 
doing it while they're critically understaffed and while their core function to deliver public safety, which is to prevent crime, disrupt crime, and solve crime, is being challenged too by the understaffing. So they have all these pressures on them at this point. Um, over the past year or so, I've been looking at ways to deal with the fact that they have critically understaffing issues with both sworn and civilian. And I've been looking at trying to civilianize um, sworn officer positions so the sworn officers can go back and do law enforcement duties. The other thing is looking at technology enhancements that can help amplify police work, um, effectiveness, accuracy, um, information, and ultimately, hopefully, the goal of that is to deliver policing services more safely to the community. Um, at this point, I will go through the recommended, recommended changes in terms of staffing. Um, there's 1281 sworn positions. Um, they had about 130 sworn vacancies, but then they graduated se session 75. That was about 21 recruits. The last number I had gotten from the department was a vacancy rate of 108 for sworn officers. Um, attrition, including retirements, was extremely high over 2022. Uh, the latest projections I've been given by the department seem to be slower than that, fortunately. Um, the department does have a second class for FY23 scheduled in June, and the budgeted FY24 recruit classes will total 47 recruits for the year. Um, I did want to state, as we've talked about in prior committee discussions, that even if the department can fully fill these classes, they will not meet their current staffing needs. And if the department can't increase both retention and recruitment initiatives, it faces a 239 officer shortage by 2025. Um, again, just pointing out that I was looking at civilianization opportunities as well as technology. The new staffing um, discussion starts on page 14, and I'll just go through those items. The first one is adding civilian firearms instructors. Uh, this is um, implementing one of the ELE-4A, well, it was ELE-4A when they were first formed, and now it's ELEFA. But this is the final audit recommendation uh, that wanted to increase annual firearms qualification from once to twice a year. Uh, they currently have five MCPD sworn officers, one park police corporal, and three professional civilian staff persons who are assigned full-time as instructors. Their workload is basically going to double with this mandate, so, which is why they're requesting six additional firearms instructors. Um, it fits well with civilianization because there are a lot of retired police officers out there now. Um, the, the retirement trend is not unique to Montgomery County Police Department. It's national. A lot of police officers were hired in the 90s to deal with the really high violent crime that they, we were all experiencing across the nation, and now they've hit retirement eligibility. Um, I did want to point out that firearms instruction does seem kind of to contradict the, the whole trend toward moving from warrior mentality to guardian mentality, but I just wanted to point out we are the most hev heavily armed civilian population in the world, right? And part of what the firearms You're not training, just saying Montgomery County. You're saying the world. Yeah, I understand, but it's the United States. United it's not, States, the United not just States. Montgomery That's County. Right. Yeah, we want to be clear on that. But part of that training has to go to not just how to shoot, but when not to shoot, right? So it is critical to have excellent firearms instruction so that police officers know how to keep the scene as safe as they possibly can. The second item is a program manager too, and that's to support officer wellness. They have a few wellness programs here and there within the department. They're not really consolidated at this point. This position would um, consolidate those types of activities. They would also conduct a formal assessment, which, which was also recommended by the audit, um, to address comprehensive needs assessment of the entire department and to expand wellness resources as needed. Um, this position would do that, and then they would they would unite the current wellness efforts. Currently, the department has several officer wellness programs, including a peer support team, access to a psychologist at the Office of Human Resources, the EAP program, and there are two new programs at the Academy right now, including sport and health, fitness, and stress and resiliency. And I just wanted to note that while it's not a direct benefit to sworn officers, the department also provides a social worker at the Emergency Communication Center to assist with employee wellness. The four part-time crossing guards, um, two will, will support a new elementary school and two will enhance student safety at an existing elementary school. We'll get to the vacancy discussion in a little bit, but the department's vacancy list shows six vacant crossing guard positions. I did reach out to the department um, 
about this, and they advise, and they can speak more to it to, um, to you about it in more detail. But these positions have been hard to fill recently. Um, but the department needs both vacant and new positions to maximize pedestrian safety, and they envision that they'll be able to hire these positions more effectively this year. Um, I did want to point out, too, police officers in the past used to be able to help with traffic and pedestrian management as needed at schools, but because they're understaffed and they have to prioritize responding to calls for service, they don't have as much flexibility to do that anymore. Um, the civilian curriculum de developer, that's a new position assigned to the training academy. Again, it's an audit recommendation. Uh, they recommended a civilian PhD deputy director to be added to the academy, and that would ensure the curriculum and instructional instructional protocols are at a university level. It would also provide a continuity of operations at the academy because sworn captains are generally rotated out of their assignments every few years. Having a civilian there as a subject matter expert who remains at the academy will provide consistent training and operations and help build institutional knowledge. Um, I did point out, I wanted to point out the critical understaffing of the public safety emergency communications specialists. Last year, um, the council, the county executive recommended and council approved 12 additional telecommunicator positions. And that was to help civilianize the fire dispatch function at the Emer emergency communication center. Right now they have a mix of civilians and uniformed firefighters who are dispatching fire calls. And that is a complicated, complex procedure. Um, however, as we will discuss tomorrow, the fire department has um, extreme understaffing issues itself. It would be helpful to return their uniformed firefighters back to the field. Um, however, this just really functionally um, just added to the vacancy rate that they have, and they currently have more than 60 vacancies at this point. Um, something that the committee has discussed for the past couple of years and the department advises in terms of retention is that several telecommunicators have stated that a true pension benefit would actually incentivize their staying. I believe other jurisdictions have true ben pension benefits. And that is part of the collective bargaining agreement proposal right now is to shift all C ECC staff over into retirement groups E and J, depending on their classification. And I just wanted to note that Senate Bill 633 of 2022 makes changes to both the classification of these 911 specialists, and that includes our county's telecommunicators, and it also removes the cap on local 911 fees. So the county could apply for an, for an increased 911 fee to fund these pension um, improvements and other parts of emergency communication center operations. Um, it would be helpful to understand if they've done that or if that's on their, their horizon to do anytime soon and, and what they expect that process might look like. Um, another thing that's not mentioned in the, in the budget itself, the recommended budget itself, but I thought was important to point out is that the department just hired its Hispanic community liaison position. It's been vacant for two years. And this position will help in the public information office, and it will help strengthen communication and understanding between the police department and, and Latino community members. Um, and the reason I point this out is because the, it helps, it is a, it, it's a position that we have seen actually help develop and maintain and increase trust between the police department and the Latino community, which is very helpful in, in solving crimes. You know, if people feel like they can trust a governmental entity, particularly the police, to actually give information and witness information, then the police are more likely to be able to solve those crimes in the community. Um, I've got a vacancy discussion on page 16. Um, again, the council requested a vacancy run by department. This is um, accurate as of March, and the department had 274 total vacancies at that time, which represented 30 million in personnel costs. I want to point out that in a department this size, that vacancy rate's going to vary every day because they're, they're making changes every day. So I did note that the number of sworn officers in the vacancy run shows at 166 vacant sworn positions, which is very different than the 108 that I was most recently given by the department. And again, there can be some variance, but that seemed really big. And I had asked if these were pooled positions that officers may share for part-time work. And the explanation I got from the department was that um, – they actually use these temporarily to put people while they're applying for special assignments or promotions. So um, I don't know how many they need to make that work. Um, I, I, I don't understand what you just said. Okay, so neither do I actually <laughs> because <laughs> I don't understand why you need a separate position to, to put 
an individual while they're applying for a different assignment or a promotion. I have a feeling we're going to hear. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. It's a number. We have to Please slide. identify you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we know who you are, but I and you know who you I are. I keep messing case. that up. I'm Darren Frank. I'm the Assistant Chief for our Management Services Bureau. Uh, so it's really that that those numbers there it's literally just a number that we can move people in there's no money associated with it but it helps in our oracle system to move people around so it's really a function of a computer system uh, that allows us to move people into one place and another place which then allows us to uh, fill other positions by position vacancy announcement or get them ready to move into a new a new promotion right so what number is, is is there actually 166? There are not, and actually, uh, uh, Ms. Frog is incredibly good at her job and is only good as the information she gets. So, what we wanted to make sure that we went on record because we've, because of what she drew to our attention from the poll for County Council, um, and what we are seeing in Telestaff and Oracle, we went through by hand and and went everything. Now, granted, everything is a snapshot from day to day. Um, but right now, uh, our sworn vacancies are 131. Um, and the difference between the 108 that she got is a miscalculation on the rookies, what that meant, because they, they were already here. Uh, for certain, we have 131 vacancies for the moment. Uh, that is continually affected by retirements, uh, people leaving the profession. We, in fact, we, Chief and I were on a call this morning and we have another uh, officer that's just going to leave the department and, and go to an, another job. Uh, so uh, we try and get a good snapshot at the beginning of every month, and we are getting better at this, but again, there's multiple systems. And at, while we're on the conversation of vacancies, I will say we have 70 vacancies in our emergency communications center, uh, and, and that's, that's off of an assigned staff of uh, 100, 198, so very, very significant down there. Susan, I guess we'll get we're going to get back to this, but did you want to finish your packet or should we sure. go ahead? I just I'll just touch on briefly that there are three different types of laps this year for the police department and that totals almost 13 million out of that 30 million that was budgeted. Um, there's a vacancy run for you on pages 18 and 19 that show positions that have been vacant at least two years and positions that have been vacant at least one year. But I'm going to move on over to the um, operations enhancements that are in the that are proposed in the budget on page 20. And the first one is funds for the security camera rebate program for Bill 1422 that you just passed last year. Yep. And that provides a rebate program for to individuals and businesses who buy a security camera. They do not have to ever provide footage to the police department. That part is completely voluntarily voluntary. These are not um, monitored in any way by the police department. Um, the draft regulations have been sent, published in the register. There were no comments received. We have not yet received, the, the council has not yet received them. Um, according to those regulations, it's limited to one camera per household for a maximum of $250 rebate. So that's approximately 2,000 households that could apply for this. Um, the one-time replacement of security and precision rifles is 366,000 for um, 40 security rifles and 14 precision rifles. These are all located in Special Operation Division Tactical Section. They are not issued to General Patrol officers. They, all of these rifles have um, passed their end-of-life stage, and they indicate the department has been trying to piece together different parts of rifles to make rifles work. And um, I was advised that as rifles age, there's increased safety risk and reliability concerns. For the Drone for First Responder Pilot Program, this program is supposed to pre-stage a drone on a county building in an area that requires a high level of first responder intervention. They can be flying, flown remotely and they can live stream video to the public safety officials to help them make real-time decisions. And it's expected that this program will help reduce challenges caused by understaffing and allow for safer decision making by law enforcement. Um, there's some information uh, provided on Chula Vista Police Department's program. They've been in operation since 2017. These programs are not meant to patrol, but they're instead supposed to be deployed for specific incidents. And in an interview with the police chief in Chula Vista, she mentioned a specific incident 
where having a drone available when people called for an individual in a restaurant who was acting erratically and waving something that they thought was a gun, the drone was able to determine that it was a cigarette lighter instead. And so the police officers had that information and were able to more accurately keep scene safety when they were dealing with that situation. So that is the that is the hope of the program. That is the best outcome of the program. And this is a pilot program to start. The one-time replacement of 100 in-car printing devices. This provides 200,000 to pro to replace 200 in-car ETICS traffic citation warning printers. Currently, 100 of them are out of warranty, and the department anticipates replacing more printers over several budget cycles. The one-time enhancement for police motorcycles is 181,000 to replace six police motorcycles, and this is primarily to address officer safety. New motorcycle, sorry are equipped with traction control, advanced interlock brakes, and GPS, which are not on current models. Again, the department anticipates replacing those over several budget cycles. One-time replacement of night vision goggles, $172,000. This um, brings them new models, which have moved from green phosphorus illumination to the white phosphorus illumination, and that provides greater clarity. Again, providing more accurate information to police officers on the scene. Uh, so that they, they can make safer and more accurate decisions. Uh, the police survey platform to support Bill 4520, that's the community policing bill that also has a large number of data elements that the police department must collect and provide to the council every year. Part of that is a survey requirement to survey both residents and officers regarding com police community relations. This platform will um, administer that, but it also has additional functionality to allow the county to update 911 callers um, and other reporting parties with text messages, provides automatic follow-up emails and text messages to crime victims, and they expect it to significantly improve community members' experience. I have a couple other technology considerations for your, for your um, review. The Violent Crime Information Center is not an item in this year's budget. Um, last year, Council appropriated about 470000 of ARPA funding to establish this Violent Crime Information Center as a pilot project, and those funds were to be used to support four crime analysts. Um, they have been able to hire two contractual analysts that conduct link analysis, track weapons data, generate violent crime statistical reports for command staff. It went live, it just went live at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, and it supported 41 calls for service or investigations, about half of those are in 3D. It's been successful in relaying real-time tactical information to officers in the field to assist with apprehensions, and it provides investigative information to better inform officer decision-making. Um, they are able to access um, some intelligent software product that they can buy, I believe, with um, surpluses they have in the operating budget um, this year. And that will be able to synthesize multiple data inputs, such as the live camera feeds, the CAD data, officer GPS feeds, license plate reader data, and more. Um, this is not a recommended budget item, and it is ARPA funds. And I know that there is concern that we're trying not to convert ARPA funds into multi-year funding. Um, but I'm. My recommendation is that this be considered by committee and council because it is one tool that shifts some real-time analytical work to civilian staff, and it leverages technology to provide real-time resources to officers on the scene. Um, if it is approved, if the drone for first responder program is approved, it can also integrate with the VCIC to provide more real-time data to officers. And I just wanted to provide a brief update on the automated traffic enforcement. This also is technology that acts as a force multiplier. Um, they had 114 speed cameras, which issued almost 300,000 tickets last year, and revenue totaled about 10.6 million. The budget assumes 13.5 million in revenues for FY24. As you can see, revenue declines every year. However, they have um, signed a new automated enforcement contract, and that will allow the number of cameras to expand by 10 speed cameras and five red light cameras per year for the life of the contract. I have listed out council staff recommendations on page 23. Again, the committees are placing all tax supported increases on the recommended operating budget to the reconciliation list. And they're also recommending that all item, items be categorized either as high priority or priority. So I've put these for your consideration, uh, recommending placing all of the CE's recommended tax supported increases as high priority reconciliation list items. Um, the council, I also recommend if you fund the VCIC uh, through the end of FY24 for an approximate cost of 200000 
Um, and if you choose to add that to the reconciliation list, it could also be a cost neutral item if you wish to also cut the security rebate funding in half for savings of 255000 which I didn't point out when I first reviewed that piece, but it would be helpful to understand where the department is on implementing the security camera rebate program. If they've got a really firm July 1st start date, that's great. If it's going to be more like fall or you know early winter, then it would be easy to cut the funding in half to, to reflect that mid-year start date for savings of about $255,000. And then I've got a proposed reconciliation list on page 24, just to illustrate what I've recommended to you. Um, depending on what the committee decides today, I, can, I will modify this to reflect your recommendations to council. Well, once again, thank you very, very much. Um, since we have started the signing bonus, the $20,000, how, how has that affected? I mean, we're all very concerned about uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, how has that affected what we're doing and what we're trying to do? Thank you, Council Member. It's made a tremendous difference. Uh, I can tell you that for this current cl uh, class, which we have closed the application for because we need time to process folks, uh, we ended with 500, uh, 509 applications for this period. Now, for the previous class, we had 395. The most remarkable thing out of that is, so this, this advertisement for Session 76, which starts uh, in June, it was open from June 13th, 2022 through March 31st. Well, through February 21st, we only had 349 applications. Uh, upon announcing the bonus program, we had an additional uh, 152 applications come in. So we went from 1.4 a day to four a day, uh, and that continues. And even more importantly along those lines, if you recall, there was some discussion in the past about comparative compliance and laterals, and we've attempted that before. Uh, we've had very, it's been a very mixed bag. Uh, the last time we attempted it, we got 14 people, uh, 14 officers apply. Unfortunately, they didn't make it through our background for a number of reasons. Once we announced the bonus, which is also applicable to lateral transfers, we have 35 applications right now. And I can tell you, so far, so good. The folks that are going, that have gone through uh, the testing process and gone through preliminary background information, they look like very solid officers and very solid additions to the Montgomery County Police. So it has made a tremendous difference. And, and, and Ms. Frog uh, touched on this before too. Is there, there's gotta be a capacity to how many people we could actually put through an academy in a year or whatever, I, you know, but you do two, a, two, two sessions a year. A little more than a year because we've upped the time in the academy through various demands, the demands that we've had either through legislation or just good practice. So we're at 29 weeks now. It's very hard to overlap classes. Right now our classroom itself is built for around 90 officers that we could put through. Now certainly the more officers we have, the more drain it is on our resources because we need more instructors, adjunct instructors that will come up and assist. But I'm quite sure the commanders and the diff different directors will help assign their folks to get these to get these young officers out on the road. But how many can you actually put through the academy at a time? Uh, 90 a session. 90 I'd say 90 a session. 90 a session. So the most we could do is 180 a year? Uh, correct. The only addition I would put to that is if we continue to have lateral uh, classes with the, by the numbers, but that's going to dwindle off a little bit. Uh, you could yeah, theoretically uh, you could probably do 220 a year. But if you figure, if you figure in how many people are retiring and how many people are leaving, and we can, let's say we can get 200, mm -hmm. we're still, it'll be several years before we can catch up by the numbers. Correct, because we still have a large, a large number of officers that are in the drop program, which, which we are, you know, we, we can predict for. Uh, but again, we're seeing a new trend uh, in law enforcement where, uh, number one, folks are leaving the profession uh, for other opportunities because there is a good job market. Uh, they're leaving for federal opportunities as well. But our retirees as well, they aren't staying as, or I'm sorry, not retired. They aren't retirees yet. Our more senior officers are not staying as long as we saw uh, before. And we're still trying to wrap our hands around that in the post-COVID age as, as, as these officers 
uh, that are approaching retirement age see the opportunities in the private sector or in another government agency that they can take advantage of at a younger age. Um, and for the automation, I think the the more that we can utilize technology to be make a safer situation for everybody involved for the for the first responder, but also for the public that, that involved, the, the better off we are. I mean, of course, there's there's an expense to to the technology to buy the technology, but and for the training of it. Um, but and and of course, we're all very concerned about the dispatching. The uh, and and the retirement is part of the uh, the um, uh, collective bargained agreements, I guess, for for that. Uh, is am I correct on that? Yes, sir. That it it yes, it is again, and and we do have information and in, in just talking with our dispatchers about what would retain them, uh, and and that certainly is an item that would retain them. You know, the fact that we have such high numbers of, it's a tough job. I mean, I, uh, I I know that it's a tough job, and I've known people that have been in the profession and said, you know what, I, I can do a lot of things that are a lot easier. I mean, and they, you know, in some cases they were volunteer firefighters at one point. I mean, they, they you know, they, they certainly knew what they were getting themselves into. Um, but in, in general, I, I think that we need to be continuing to to make certain that that the uh, that the uh, technology is there, that we certainly make certain that that we are uh, uh, not only uh, attracting but retaining air, air officers. And I and I know in some cases they weren't leaving the profession or the career. They they left Montgomery County to go to get twenty thousand dollars from in Arundel County or wherever they were going. Correct, and actually we, we have seen, and this has been the history since Chief Jones started, since I've started, we do see a number of officers leave for what they consider to be greener pastures and come back. I, I am happy to report that we've had, that uh, Chief Jones has approved uh, two rehires as of late, officers that have, dis have you know, come to realize the benefits they get from being associated with our community associated with FOP Lodge 35, associated with a county such as this. So we, we do su success in people returning to the agency, uh, but we'd like to stop, and we'd just like to stop them from leaving the agency and fully understand the, the uh, terrific atmosphere we have here. Any? Yeah, I did have some. These may be coming out of order from the order we were all talking in, but that's just the way it goes when we go through a, a large amount of stuff. Um, since we were just talking about retirement, and and I know we use the phrase the drop, but you know, for all the many people at home, they may not know what that means. Um, but there was a bill at the state level, and I don't know whether it passed, that would have extended the period of time that an officer could stay in the drop. And I think it might have been just applicable to state law enforcement. Um, but I want I just wanted to know whether that was or wasn't something that apply to you all yeah it, do, it does not apply to us so we have a three-year drop program so okay. of course and just to on the record it's you know once you enter into the drop you are already eligible for retirement um, you can leave at any moment right. um, between uh, the time that you enter until the, the third the three-year anniversary but on a three-year anniversary it is um, it is uh, definitive that you will leave county, uh, you will leave the uh, police department. Right, right. right. And, and I think it should be, from what I have on my notes, which way back when, these are old notes, it, that stands for Discontinued Retirement Service uh, Plan. That's, that's right. what DROP stands for, it's DR, yeah. That's correct, yeah. DRSP, yeah. but. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, but they, you but DROP doesn't fancy sound as, with yeah, that. yeah, no, no, it's not government enough. It's right? not government yeah. enough, yeah. no. Um, and you were talking about the, the numbers of people you could have per class, you know, up to capacity, if you will. Um, and of course, noting that, you know, there are a large number of people who have now applied and you got a bump after the announcement about the, the bonus. But what are the main issues that are precluding individuals from passing background and being able to enter the academy? The two issues, two issues that we see a lot more now uh, number one is 
drug use, there's certain disqualifiers from the st from MPCTC uh, at the state level, uh, and we have you know uh, changes in society where folks have have done a few more things than they used to back in the day. Uh, so some of those regulations, you know, could could be looked at uh, on, on a whole. But that's one of the reasons that uh, we see people drop out. The other we see integrity issues uh, in the background, either through uh, criminal activity or, uh, you know, the other part of it is the polygraph. And uh, unfortunately, we still, see, even though we clearly lay out what the process is, what you're going to have to do, and, and clearly say, look, just tell us. Because if you don't tell us, you're, it's, it's an automatic disqualifier because it's an integrity issue, and that's so important to the police experience. Uh, so we see those. We also see a lot of people just select self-select out of the process, and this doesn't have to do particularly with us, but all over the country we're seeing this, uh, that people, while they put in to apply and they begin the process for an, any number of reasons, they self-select out. Gotcha. Okay. Um, when we were talking about the VCIC and the pilot program for the drone and totally actually really love both concepts, the one that's already running and the one that could come to complement it because they could work really well together, um, the software needed for the VCIC to enhance operations, has that a procurement that has already gone out or is one that's anticipated for FY24? Uh, council member, we have looked at a few uh, packages from various vendors and a decision was made and looking at our uh, availability of existing FY23 funds, we are mm -hmm. able to move ahead with that. Okay. Okay. And the ARPA funds that were allocated, they are, they have, a lot of them have been spent, but they're, they haven't all been spent, correct? Okay. So there's some carryover in ARPA funding that will trickle into FY24. Right now, the folks staffing it, the analysts staffing it are contractors, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And are you planning to hire regular? So, um, you know, it will be, again, the goal is to um, really have this as a longstanding program. Um, right now, it is contracted out. Um, it would be our goal to actually have county employees to uh, that we could actually uh, be trained and, and uh, would come on board with us in the long run. Okay. Then the reason I'm asking that is because that's generally more cost effective when we and continuity based when we can have a, a county employee yes. doing things above a, a contractor, correct. but understanding that this was its initial launch this this year. Um, scrolling backwards, sorry. Uh, the civilian curriculum developer and man the individual who's going to coordinate and manage all of the training programs and making sure everything's compliant. Um, I'm assuming that person would also be uh, looking for annual changes in the law, either state or federally, and of course locally, that would impact any of the training programs so that adjustments could be made to the curriculum. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So as we know that um, you know we have to look at that annually. Um, in order to adjust training um, accordingly as a, any laws that effectively change that, whether it's at the county uh, level or state or federal level, um, it does require us to, to make sure that we are maintaining that continuity um, and uh, addressing those uh, issues in a timely manner. Um, because when you have to bring back an entire police department to train them, as we did with uh, use of force example, Last year, we had to bring back and then bring them back in a very short period of time. It did take curriculum development to, to put that into place um, and to transition into that to, the, to that training. And for, I honestly don't remember how, I don't remember how often this has to happen, but there is a, a time period in which a curriculum that's been approved for training needs to be reapproved or recertified, right? So we get audited by the Maryland Training mm -hmm. Commission, um, and they often come through and they will uh, um, review all of our um, lesson plans for, for all of our training, whether it's entry level 
and in service level. Um, and so it does make sure that we have to stay up to the standards and that our lesson plans have been updated. So that's another task yeah. that, that the curriculum developer will have to uh, be a part of and potentially oversee, uh, again, for that continuity that, that, we're, that we wish for. Great. Um, the last questions I have are with respect to the officer wellness program manager too. Is that individual going to also help coordinate um, services that would allow for external referrals for officers, like to help connect them to external support other than the, the psychologists and psychiatrists who are affiliated with the department? Yeah, we, we want to expand, and, and that's, that's been a goal of ours for a while, and certainly the Police Accountability Act and other measures have really brought it to the forefront, and also when you look nationally at different studies through PERF or through ICP, officer wellness becomes a tremendous issue. Uh, so this position, yes, we, we, we want to make sure that uh, all of our officers and professional staff, because they, they experience some, of the, some similar uh, uh, issues as well uh, have some place to look and get information if they need. There's a lot of different places right now that they can look, but we want to create some place where where all of our employees can look, especially under the law enforcement umbrella, can look for assistance and be connected if if they want to be connected. There are certain issues that that need to be negotiated with the different unions as far as anything mandatory, but what we want to provide are service provide access to services. Plus, also that position in addition to that. Uh, we do have a lot of injured people, and part of their responsibility is going to help managing that. Right now, uh, and again, this is another snapshot uh, of, of what we look like, but in March we have over 80 officers that are in a different duty status than full duty because of any number of issues. And managing that to ensure that, that uh, uh, we know their restrictions, what they can and can't do, and then we as a department can be educated as where we can assign those officers and, and not violate any restrictions, make accommodations, uh, meeting all those uh, mandatory needs. Right now, I, we just have one person and there's too much work. The only other thing I'll say, and, and, and uh, Ms. Frog hit on it, is we have a lot of officers and professional staff that have a passion for wellness, and they've created programs. We've got a fantastic officer at the academy who's created a stress and resilience program that is just getting rave reviews. And what we want to do is make sure that we have continuity of operations there, because if that officer decides to retire next week, that program goes away because of the way we're structured right now. So we feel this is a critical position, uh, position to help us continue to develop our wellness efforts and make sure that there's always a resource uh, that, that we can point someone to very readily. And the same thing for the uh, ECC, the social worker who's there, uh, I'm assuming they also, that role can help facilitate the individuals working there receiving or getting to, connecting to other programs outside connecting just there at the office so that they're able to help. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely, I mean, it's working now, so it's working well. So we feel good about that, that, that we know our ECC employees have that accessibility. Again, they work in, you know, in an environment that's, I, I, say, I say to them often that um, it's out of sight, out of mind for many because just because of the, the uh, the location where they're inside for their entire shift and, and that social worker uh, being there with them and being able to work with them with issues on site is very valuable. Super. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I wanted to just note first, um, thank you, Susan, for the packet. Really appreciate all the all the. Um, work put into it. Um, the racial equity argument, I will note that I don't fully agree with the framing of it. Um, I think that there is a, a larger discussion that we need to have over time about the many different factors that contribute to and impact public safety in addition to policing and, uh, you know, what metrics we should be using as we analyze, uh, you know, relative impact and investment decisions and all, all that sort of thing. Um, that said, uh, for the question of today's budget discussion, I think we still land in basically the same place, um, that we have staffing issues um, and we, we need to make sure that we are 
uh, I think, in my opinion, and I think what I've been hearing from a lot of folks, and this is what you know we're talking about in a lot of different departments across the county, uh, we have a lot of needs, but the number one need is people. Uh, and making sure that we are able to uh, to be staffed. Uh, and so making sure that we're able to stay staffed, freeing up police time, um, I think that uh, those are certainly have a focus of the packet, have been a focus of our conversations. And um, so that was kind of the lens that I used as I, as I went through the packet as well. And so a few conversation points um, as we think about uh, the fact that the, the GEO committee just recently approved the FOP's contract, so that will move uh, to full council for discussion. I think that certainly ties in as we're looking at staffing, recruitment, and retention, um, noting also that all of those contracts are, you know, they, they made it out of the committee, but we're going to have to discuss them in relation to all of the other budgetary pressures as well. So I do think that it's important that we go through and uh, and find if there's areas where we can find savings or where we can uh, have a delay um, that don't um, impact kind of this most critical question of staffing and police time, um, then would appreciate your, uh, you know, your input on, on those items. Um, okay, so one of them I wanted to come back to um, that uh, Councilmember Lukey mentioned was the officer um, wellness support position. Um, certainly agree that wellness is, a, is important, right, and is a critical need. Um, that said, I did note that um, in a letter um, from Mr. Holland on um, behalf of the FOP, uh, that they had noted that this was something that, you know, that they really wanted more discussion around first, uh, that they would like to see bargained. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, this is a position that is going to be made meaningful by how much use gets made out of it, right, by the, by the officers that it's available to. And so, you know, my concern is that if here we have a preponderance of officers who have not agreed that this is a priority that, that they want uh, at this moment, then maybe it makes more sense to give this one a little time uh, for the union to continue to, to discuss that. Um, if they don't want that kind of being weighed against their salaries, which I will just note that salaries are all, bumps are also good for wellness. Um, if they don't want that being weighed against their salaries, then, you know, I don't know that I, I want to be doing that. Um, so thoughts from, from any of you or, uh, or from other council members on that? Well, I think, you know, from an, an interesting part of this discussion is, first and foremost, is that uh, we as the police administration give, uh, um, give officer wellness a very high it's a very high concern of mine. It has been, um, particularly since we've had an officer most recently in the past uh, four years who committed suicide on duty. Um, and um, I've had this conversation with uh, President Holland on several occasions about uh, issues that we've been wanting to put out to try to assist our officers um, with mental wellness as well as physical wellness. Um, and it, this is not just because um, of us trying to intervene in a mental health, and it's not about a need to know based upon um, the executive staff. And it's always been the concern of the FOP from that perspective. And that's understandable, but the reality is um, I don't need to hear from the police psychologist about every officer. And, I, and in fact, I spoke to Dr. Uh, um, just um, a few months ago, and he explained to me that he has seen over 800 officers in one year and, um, and did not give me any insight on any given officer, nor did I ask. Um, and I think, again, I think it's important that, that our officers have that freedom to be able to get the help that they need and have the resources uh, made available. But we are a very large police agency. We are not a small agency. When I have one person who not only are we talking about from a mental health uh, standpoint of wellness, but we're also talking about people who get injured, who are sick, who are under doctor's orders, who cannot work um, in their full capacity. And it takes um, an incredible amount of time to monitor those officers in order to try to help them get back um, in a healthy um, status 
um, in order to be, help them to come back to work that then helps out with our manpower issues. Um, and so these are the grave needs that we have. I am more than willing and have been willing for the entire time I've been the chief of police to have that conversation with the FOP um, and have a more extensive. This is something that's been going on for many years. But we are one of the most unique agencies in this country in not having a sufficient wellness program, um, unlike, you know, where, you know, other departments have worked hand in hand with their FOPs who come on board to make sure that those officers are getting the help that they need. And that's what I asked for Mr. Holland. That's the only thing that I think, again, because I care, we care. Um, and I think that, and I think everyone in the county government also cares, and we don't want to see another incident like we saw a few years ago. Um, and that's just one aspect of it. So I'll just I, leave I it appreciate there. that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I certainly agree um, as a priority that mental health and wellness is is critically important, especially in this line of work. Um, and my only question would be is if, you know, the implementation would be better given more time to coordinate with, uh, you know, with the union and, and come up with something that the officers, you know, feel good about and feel, you know, comfortable using. And I certainly, you know, don't doubt that you would respect their, their privacy concerns um, and all of that. But, uh, you know, as, as we're just looking at, and this is like a relatively small, thing, but um. You know, I'm just, we're trying to be fiscally responsible here, and if it's going to um, have more ROI if we introduce it, you know, next year, um, then, you know, I think that's something that's that's worth considering, but. So I think, I think, I think one of the issues is, and, and I'm, <laughs> I've got the one part of the Police Accountability Act open, but it's 72 pages long, so I'm digging through trying to find. So there was a part of that that required an employee assistance program, and then it got gray lined out. And then I'm trying to see where it ended up or where it elsewhere popped up within this multiple pieces of legislation that got cobbled together, because it isn't just one bill. I just want to be clear. That act, um, and it's known collectively as the Police Accountability Act of 2021, but it was actually multiple bills that created the act, so it's not one thing. Um, but it was my understanding that every department was supposed to have that and that that was required, that you offer that in some way, shape, or form, um, and that that was not something that we have time to delay on. They already, they have something in place already. They're trying, you know, as anything new that you try out might, might not be getting totally to the finish line when you start it and you take feedback to figure out what the employees want that's different or better or enhances and that's something we should be doing over time and um, you know I, I certainly would appreciate too that that rank and file officers aren't always comfortable saying well am I going to the person who's at my employer's office but that's why I asked the questions about do you facilitate to external services and things like that to get directly to that point which is that you should have a conduit almost like a side step to HR that helps facilitate people getting to where they need to be, but not being necessarily the person who's directly providing therapeutic services. And, and that's correct. And that's, that was established where our police psychologists used to work within our own facility. Um, and we work with the union and the union demanded that that be removed from the police department. So mm -hmm. the police psychologists are not even assigned to the police department. They are under OHR and they are in a separate facility. Okay. So we never see um, and are not observant into exactly where um, the, uh, the officers are attending, um, you know, to, to visit this police psychologist. Okay. Good afternoon. For the record, Lee Holland, president of FOP Lodge 35. <clears throat> Health and wellness is our top priority for our members. Uh, it's a mandatory subject of bargaining. The reason why the letter came was we have a grave concern over the budget next year. And if it's passed, how it's presented, there's definitely going to be a hole and we're trying to find ways. How can we make changes in the budgets that way we can have a sustainable budget so that way next year we're not making cuts in services. Um, We've had a wellness committee with the executive for probably two years now. It really hasn't done anything. During the last term bargaining, we tried to expand it. The executive's branch told us they didn't have the money to expand it. Um, so to see a program manager come in the budget as new money, 
seemed inappropriate to us. Now, I don't have any problem with a position being created from a vacant position to have the manager while we're working at the wellness program, but I don't think we should be creating new positions if we're trying to find ways to save money. That's part of our letter. Yeah, I mean, I think that that makes, that makes sense. Um, uh, I mean, I, I understand all, all the arguments. We are looking for ways to make sure that our, the very top priorities make it through the finish line. Um, so I appreciate that input. I also wanted to check um, how this position uh, would relate to the EAP, the employee, what is that, employee assistance program? Assistance, program? Yeah. Is there overlap there or connection or? There would be overlap. They, again, we're, we're, we're putting a number of duties upon this person and, and part of that would be making sure that uh, employees more consistently uh, tap into that very extraordinary program. A lot of people don't don't realize that it's out there. So it becomes an education resource. Uh, again, a high priority from everyone at this table that, that we get all our folks the information and, and also break down some uh, stigma and part of that you do by getting them information and providing uh, providing a professional staff person that can that can point them in the direction of that information. Uh, and so yes. Thank you. Yeah, so that was another question that I that I had. If there was, you know, we have this employee uh, assistance program that exists. Are there ways that we can, even if we're going to create this position, say, down the line, potentially, or some form of, you know, other wellness supports, um, is there a way to bridge the gap by um, just getting the information out to officers, um, you know, more thoroughly about the EAP and connecting them without having to create a whole new position right now, would that be a way to help bridge the gap, potentially? Um, had questions about a few of the other ones? If I, well, if I, I don't know if you that, I, did, I just wanted to point out that if, if we don't put the, the dollars in the budget, there is no way that we could hire a person or, or do something if the the minds could could come together if we if we put the money in it doesn't necessarily mean that that person would be hired but there's always that possibility the person could be hired so i have no problem putting the dollars in the budget and and you know uh, have the have the uh, people uh, sitting at a table just deciding on if and when we should be hiring someone and who it should be but i, I think we need to make certain the money is there if the minds can meet. So. Well, I think and some of you have heard me say this because you've been in the room when I've said it in other hearings. Um, one concern that I have is finding out that agencies could move up to 10% of their budget around in categories without our approval, which seems problematic to me in terms of our fiscal oversight, right? Um, because depending on the size of the agency, it could be a good chunk of change. A small, small department's a tiny budget. Big department, whoa, that's a lot of money. So um, that's something that I'm, you know, committed to, to working on so that we have some greater checks and balances there on things because if people are appropriating money that's for personnel, it should be used for personnel. If you're appropriating money to do a specific program, it should be for that program. If an adjustment needs to be made, because heaven knows life changes and things happen, that's okay, but it should come before the council to be fleshed out before it's just done. Um, but there are things in here, and, and Ms. Farag went through them and, and has made some recommendations like the, the issue with the timing of the camera rebate right. program, right? Like, so the regs went out, they're not before us yet, we don't know when we'll have them. Um, then there's the implementation part of the program, so chances are we're probably not going to use all that would be appropriated to that, so we could move some of that over to the VCIC. That makes sense. The issue with the motorcycles, do all six need to be replaced right away? Could they be staggered over multiple fiscal years? The printers, 100 of them are already out of warranty, so those are the critical need right up front, but, and you're going to need funding for several years thereafter to keep cycling through them to make sure you've got everything on the right path. But like many things with equipment, you don't want everything to go offline under warranty at the same time or else you're going to have another big problem in a few years. So I would prefer if we could take a look at some of those little mm -hmm. more nitty-gritty pieces to try and figure out and have your feedback and input to us now on whether you think that's reasonable and can we 
maybe make some adjustments so that we're not doing all the things right at one time on those. And I know they're not big chunks of change, but can we do some of that or move those down to priority instead of high priority and stick the truly high priority things at the top? And, and we interrupted you. Yeah. And, on the, and I got off topic, so please, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. No, I agree. To, we should definitely come back and, and look at those. Um, all right, so, okay, question about um, a few of the other personnel uh, positions here. The um, I certainly think that it is a very it is very worthwhile to civilianize some of our positions so that we can free up the time of our sworn officers um, and, uh, and and looking at how exactly we want to do that in a strategic sense since there's going to be a cost to making that transition. Um, the the civilian firearms instructors um, we're looking at six six of those for uh, you know quarter million is there um, uh, you know, how, how would you all feel about doing that potentially in like two tranches or putting those, you know, that as a consideration before the council? What kind of uh, impact would that make on your, um, uh, uh, you know, on time being spent? It, we would be fine with that. We, we need to uh, gradually ramp up our training and some of these things go together, right? The curriculum developer, the civilian PhD, uh, our uh, use of force and de-escalation unit. So time is on our side there. It's something we, we don't have now, but again, uh, between the different mandates, whether it be police accountability or in this case, especially ELE 4A, uh, that is, that is a uh, recommendation. Uh, that they feel strongly about, so we could do it in two tranches. We can, uh, if if that will assist. I, I think that's a, 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 a reasonable way to go about it, especially with the economic impacts we have. Great. I think that that would be certainly at least a helpful option to have before us when we come to the reconciliation table um, to split that. Great. Um, the I also looked at the civilian uh, curriculum developer. That's one person, and that. Let's see, it said in the packet, I think that the captains are generally rotating through that. So I think that seems like that makes sense to, to shift that to civilianize that and free up um, that time. Also wanted to certainly reemphasize the importance of um, addressing the understaffing amongst our, our dispatchers. So I uh, appreciate the focus that we've had on that. Um, also noting that I believe Montgomery College has a program for training dispatchers, and this is not a budgetary uh, concern of ours right now, but I'm just going to note that um, it would be great to kind of improve that pipeline from MCPS uh, into that um, dispatcher program and, and help keep some of our, our local kids here to work on that. No, I, I agree, Council Member. Thank you. And, and I, I will say, and you touched on the contracts earlier and the, the benefits, that is one of the big things that we're up against. I, I was actually having a brainstorming meeting the other day. and was thinking we, we could do X and advertise what a great starting salary it was to be an ECC operator. And my folks told me, yeah, but didn't you see Walmart's hiring at $25 an hour? And right. And and look, it's the reality we're faced we with. We kept up with their competition. Yeah. Uh, and our competition is, is, is jobs that we didn't even consider before would be at that level. Uh, but we're going to keep, and, and, and that's a great pipeline, and we've got some, we've got some, uh, uh, really expanded into the high schools because again, this is a fantastic starting job. I mean, immediate benefits, in my mind, forty-six thousand a year was again for a high school student graduating that may not be thinking about college right now. It's, it's a, it's an opportunity. Kids out there, we're gonna, we're gonna improve that. Don't worry. <laughs> we are gonna improve that. I can't speak to that. And then come, in. <laughs> right? We need you. Wait till May. Um, to that point, I'm yeah. sorry, Commissioner, no, no. Council Member Meek. I'm, no, by all means. If I say commissioner, it's because the county I came from, they were county commissioners. No. <laughs> Please forgive me. Um, but to to the point about the Walmart, um, we've looked. We're looking under every budgetary rock, county, state, federal funding to 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 increase services and to. Uh, Looking at our cadet pay, that's uh, 1755 an hour. Mm -hmm. When you can go to Walmart or be a server at a restaurant and make 22. I mean, so we're again looking to uh, under every budgetary rock possible to uh, make sure that we don't have holes in our budget. Mm -hmm. Appreciate and can that. speak to those things. Appreciate that, and I think the conversations also that we've been having about freeing up the time 
of and just being uh, you know strategic about how we're making sure our current officers are, are able to use their time um, that that is also obviously remains a really important uh, piece of the puzzle um, as well um, the drone program just a couple of questions about some of the technicalities of that I realize that you're still looking at it um, on a pilot basis but um, how long is the information stored so as far as information stored from that the drones would uh, are they do you do you anticipate any time in the future when the drones would be doing any doing um, you know any kind of routine surveillance or if not that then just you know when they go out on it yeah so there will be no routine surveillance so the drone will only be activated um, from and it will be from uh, locations where it can fly in a two two mile radius, um, it will be activated literally by um, by a nine one one call um, in that general vicinity where it can be uh, sent to the very location in which the call you know the call uh, um, the action is occurring or event has occurred, um, and so we will be documenting every um, every um, dispatched. Um, drone. Um, we'll talk about, you know, what did the drone do? What was its functionality? Um, how long was it in the air? Um, what we will be capturing video, so we will be saving that video as we would do um, our body worn camera footage video uh, because we'll be utilizing that as evidence just the same. Uh, we are more than happy to be uh, very um, transparent. Um, with the drone program as we're developing it so that we make sure that people know the types of calls that we're activated the drone for. Again, you know, the things that we're um, just initially looking at are robberies in progress. Um, you know, someone with a gun call, um, as, a, as it was noted in an example by Ms. Farag. Um, you know, and these are the things that are many of the types of those dangerous calls that are happening in our urban environments, particularly in the third and the fourth district. So those are where we're going to begin with the pilot. It will not go beyond that, um, um, that, um, that, that, that assignment um, as we begin the program. Um, it won't be 24 hours a day. Um, it will be generally in our higher uh, traffic uh, of calls. Uh, time period. It would probably be during the daytime hours as we will not be flying the drone at night. Um, so in order for it, to, again, from a safety perspective. Okay. okay. And, and it's great to hear you speak to the tra to transparency, acknowledging that there are going to be concerns, which I which I share, but sure, I have absolutely. the conversation. Absolutely. Um, and the different types of information that it's going to be collecting and, and that you are going to be collecting as you do oversight over the program, um, is that some is that information that the public will have access to, the council, the PAC, the PAB? Everyone, yes. Everyone will have access to, to, uh, to the information again and towards its deployment, um, how it's being um, utilized, um, and we will be providing, um, you know, updates um, on our websites. Um, exactly, we'll put out full reports, um, and we're welcome. We're more than happy to report to all of who you just uh, spoke about to be able to speak to the program. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then uh, acknowledging certainly that the you know judicious use of technology is something that can be a tool um, for us and in regard to staffing as well as just you know general public safety outcomes and that kind of thing um, but of course to be fiscally responsible and and otherwise we want to make sure that we are being judicious and um, so in regards to the to the drone program do we have data showing that drones you know increase uh, or improve public safety outcomes are there like metrics that we have that we can point to um, do we have any information about how other jurisdictions might have set up um, guardrails or accountability systems, uh, you know, to address civil liberties concerns? If you could just speak to some of the background, that would be great. Yeah, so um, as it, uh, it's noted in the packet, Chula Vista, uh, California, is one of the leading departments um, in, in drone deployment. Um, they have put out a very extensive report. In fact, uh, we've been working with uh, um, our, our police uh, executive um, research foundation, which is PERF. Um, they, they have 
uh, put out a significant uh, report. Um, we are actually sending a team of our um, executives out to um, California where we'll be meeting with the chief of uh, Chula Vista uh, and to talk to their legal counsel and beyond to talk about a lot of those the very things that you mentioned. Um, as we, again, put together the packet of what are the metrics. Again, understanding that, um, again, what are we looking for? We're looking for a quick response um, in order to be able to put our officers in the correct location. And I'll give an example. A 911 call goes out, right? Well, we're wait when the 911 call goes out, there's been probably a two or three minute, um, if not longer, conversation with the 911 call taker. Um, the call taker generally is putting the information into the computer, sending it to the dispatcher to get officers en route. But as the information is coming, right, they're still talking to the call taker. That information still has to be transferred. Um, we're envisioning to be able to be able to tap in and, uh, and hear real time the information coming in from the real time caller in order to be able to send the drone to the proper location quicker and to be able to see if the suspects are have left the scene and to be able to uh, potentially if they're on foot for example if we could imagine in downtown silver spring we know that the metro is utilized as a getaway for many people who commit crimes um, are are they in a vehicle um, are we able to identify said vehicle and get the officers to that location in a very quick manner that's some of the success stories we've heard that have come from, example, Chula Vista, um, in their in regards to their um, positive outcomes and be able to solve crimes in a quicker and then again to create even a safer officer safety and community safety environment because you now are sending officers um, to the scene where the drone can actually see more before the officer drives into the scene. Um, and to be able to, again, to protect those that might be involved in any event um, and to be able to see what is actually happening, what is actually in an individual's hands. Um, you know, as an example, does the suspect have a gun, yes or no? Um, that would be just one example. But these are the types of things and positive outcomes that we're going to be searching for. And again, when we talk about real-time responses, it's the same thing really when we're looking at our Violent Crime Information Center. We're looking for the ability to be able to tap in um, to some of the camera systems that we have. And we've had success in that. For example, we had a carjacking in the 4th District at, in Whedon um, at near the Westfield Shopping Center. Um, and that drone, I mean, not the drone, but the, uh, the cameras were able to actually, um, with the contractors, were able to zoom in on where our suspects were seen, last seen, as, as was described, and we located those suspects, and they were uh, uh, placed under arrest without incident. So those are some, again, um, some things, and they've been very uh, fruitful to our officers in providing intelligence to them and getting information um, that's been going back and forth that's been able to, again, address crime in a quicker manner to be able to solve those incidents. Thank you for that. Um, and um, I just think you're connecting with Chula Vista to get more, more information there. Um, anything that you can provide to us between now and when we hit the reconciliation table about about um, uh, about this program and you know policies that you're considering for it, guardrails you're considering for it, um, oversight options uh, for us for the county, um, uh, whatever you can. And then, and of course, as you're as you're talking about, you know, the research and the data. Um, which you know, you're giving us some some examples, but things that go beyond you know the case studies, but kind of paint the larger picture, will be helpful because um, I, I do want to acknowledge that of course drone programs, as we know, just have they come with civil liberties concerns. Um, certainly, as we can hear, that they can be used as as tools for good. We want to make sure that anything that happens here, we're going to be able to address those concerns. So whatever you can provide us um, before we have the larger discussion would be helpful. Um, and um, the next couple of things I have are some of those nitty gritty items. Why don't you, you, you finish, please? I, I did want to, I don't know yeah. if you can answer this, but um, so when I'm, I'm hearing council member makes questions and obvious concerns about wanting to make sure everything's constitutionally sound with respect to these tools that are used. Um, 
and I and it took me a hot minute to because I know the acronym, but I was like, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Um, so groups like the ATAC and the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and there's a whole system of federal judges who have advised on how these things work, how they work constitutionally. Uh, and so my understanding when I read about the drone program was it would be no different because it would follow the same types of protocols that are already in place for use with other investigative tools that are able to observe things out in the open. So again, you're not talking about entering someone's home or anything like that. Um, but no different than license plate readers, for example. So, um, or the camera systems that are used to, and then as you discussed just now with the carjacking at Wheaton, were able to be utilized in order to visualize and then hone in on your suspects to, in order to effectuate an arrest without, um, without incident. And so, you know, to me, it was akin to that, which is to say there is a very large and broad established legal framework for this that already exists um, that, you know, our, our U.S. district court judges and appellate court judges have advised on, the, advised the U.S. attorney's offices on, and then, of course, local departments have been participating in for years um, in the types of collaborative work that are done in the public safety arena. The ATAC has, what is it, 200 plus organizations that are part of the ATAC here in Maryland. Um, so, you know, I just, I just wanted to make that clear because it is, you know, drones sound scary um, unless they're making your Amazon delivery. But I wanted to make sure that everybody, uh, you know, was on the same page with that, that obviously we do need to be mindful of constitutional concerns, but also that this is not uh, a situation where we would be reinventing the wheel. There's already established protocol there. And, and to, to make note, we already have a drone program. Mm -hmm. This first responder program is just an addition. So our policy, which has been vetted, and and you're exactly right, Council Member uh, Lukey, in regards to the uh, legalities and um, and of course, with we work with our county attorney's office also to make sure that we are within, you know, within to make sure we're protecting civil liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our existing drone program, that does exist, and we'll make sure that this is a part and, and, and a, an addendum to, um, and, and, be, and still stay within that framework of legal, legal terms. Thank so. you. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and noting also, as you've, as you've, as you've uh, mentioned here, that in addition to ensuring that we are um, constitutionally sound, um, making sure that we are able to address, you know, community concerns about civil liberties that, you know, we want to do, make sure that we're going above and beyond here in, in Montgomery County to, to do everything right. And, and also to ensure that, you know, it's a big pot of money and it's, it's a, it's a pilot program, but to be able to say that this is, um, this over something else is what is going to, you know, enhance public safety, you know, for, and, and you know where I'm going with this. Um, okay, so look forward to that conversation. Um, okay, to a, a smaller thing, but that's a similar price tag, uh, the, the in-car printing devices. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this, but um, wanted to have, a, you know, a, a similar conversation to what we had earlier about if there's ways to spread out this cost or delay this cost, what the impact on that would be. Um, it's a... Uh, you know, I mean, we need to address expired warranties. Um, are, are these really a must-have in a tough budget season? Um, would appreciate input on that. So the and the and the county executive had pointed questions for us too because of the cost around these devices. Uh, essentially, we've turned officers' cars into offices, yep. and this this printer supports everything they do, from issuing traffic citations to providing uh, the opportunity to provide different documentation to citizens. Uh, so it is a critical piece of the package now. Uh, the and and what we're trying to do with our budget and what we've found over the years is and and. To, to be honest, a couple of these items are things that uh, uh, have crept up. They weren't managed in the best of ways where, as you were discussing, can we do a little at a time? Yeah. So for this particular item, this is us trying to do a little at a time and put this into our budget every single year rather than drop a big bill at, a big bill at once. Um, can we duct tape things together and keep things running? We can. Uh, that's not the preference. What we'd like to do is get these things into into the base budget and going year after year as we go, so that we don't uh, we don't run into the issue 
uh, with some other systems that we have that we need to do a, a replacement all at once. And that's kind of what I've spoken with uh, Chief Jones and, and Director Phillips about is doing that with our budget going forward. So uh, understanding that it's a tough time, uh, again, we, we can look to modify, but we have to keep this on the radar. That we gotta continue, We got to do business a little bit different than we've done in the past where we come and say, the sky is falling, we need to replace it. Um, uh, so uh, understanding that, we, we want it on the, on the radar, and, but we're open to discussion if it, if it really needs to. But again, this is part of our effort to be, believe it or not, fiscally responsible going forward uh, so that all of the needs of the department are captured year in, year out, and we have a better plan for it. Yeah, can I add, um, some of these printers are probably over 10 years old, I would believe. When we first got the program started from uh, state police moving to the automated system rather than paper tickets. It's actually one of the biggest complaints I get from officers is how slow the printer is or it's not working at all and they have to revert back to a handwritten ticket. So I do think these are important to replace and to replace them in a slow increments like we're trying to do. So I agree with it. So to, to clarify, the 200K, um, for the, with, are we looking at a potential of, of 200K every year or is it bigger this year as we kind of kick off this potential? Base it it would be it would be bigger this year, and we can we can modify again because we are so far behind because of the age of the printers. But we can modify going forward, and that's part of the plan that with Director Ladonna uh, that I've had for her in addressing of our equipment needs is let's come up with a plan every year similar to we've got a fantastic program with Taser now, but uh, on the same thing that we periodically replace things uh, so they don't all don't come due in a year. So um, the, you know, we could end up seeing in subsequent years, based on how the equipment is performing, uh, reductions to 50 a year as opposed to 100. But whatever's best to get us on a yearly schedule for these things. How many are out there? Uh, 900. We have 900 units. Okay. So 100. Give or take. Every nine, every nine years. But, and if I could just jump in for a second. <laughs> First off, we should not be putting things together by no. any other means and having the right equipment. It's not fair to, and, and I guess, did the state give us or their state tickets? We don't, we don't get the funding. Yeah, we don't, we don't get, get the, the revenue for a traffic ticket. Do they used to give us the tickets? Yeah, well, they still do, and, and so it's not a mandate. It's not a mandate that we use the electronic. Oh, I see. They would still do that if we. Yes, I still have a ticket. We shouldn't do that. Car because right. I've seen I don't want to. Yeah. They're yeah. dusty. <laughs> they, they are, but I don't want to take a printer from an officer out there uh, on patrol. Uh, so I, I'll write a ticket or write write a warning. Um, but uh, no, the state. There's no mandate from the state that we use their system. Other than we do have to enter tickets into the system afterwards, which becomes this is the right way to do it. Yeah. It is the right way, to, and it, and it's better for our citizens. To be honest, I got to tell you, and, and I'm sure President Holland and Chief Jones will tell you, back in the day when you had to write a couple tickets, and it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it was some of the most contentious uh, interactions with with citizens that we ever had. Now, officers, if they need to write two tickets, or even just one, it you scan a license and you're done and you get folks back on their way if if they violated some law enough that they need a ticket or a warning. Gotcha. I'm sorry, I interrupted. I just wanted to, again, back up what uh, A.C. Frank was saying about getting things on a regular schedule of uh, recurring maintenance and repair. And to your point, Council Member Lukey, one of the ways to keep us from going to OMB and saying move 10 percent of this yeah. is getting these things on a regular schedule. So. I can meet with our OMB analyst, Mr. Harrigan, and say, hey, you know we're building this in every year. You know, there's right. going to be 100 printers right. every year. There's going to be so-and-so uh, motorcycles every year. So we can get them so we don't have to, at the end of the year, say, make this big move. So that's something yeah. that I've been asked to do. And I, I was trying to do the math, and that's why I asked, is it all 900 in one year or not? Because yeah. I was trying to figure out how much the printers cost per unit based on the budget request and the, you know, and then got distracted with other questions, but that's why we have a little calculator right here on the, on the computer. But yeah, just, and also just wanting to be really mindful of any time you buy all the things at one time, they all expire at one time and, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to be in that position. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you for the background. That's helpful. Um, and as you, uh, 
you know, put together a potential proposal for making this a regular thing. The more you can spread these out and help to find savings is much appreciated. Um, okay, the night vision goggles and scopes similarly certainly see the benefit. Um, is this a nice to have that increases effectiveness but is not essential for right now? Is there something, um, you know, are we are we incapable of being effective now with with what we have? Is this something that could that could wait? So, I, I'm I'm the civilian here on staff, so. I was given the opportunity to see how these scopes operated, and it's it's a night and day difference. Literally, um, literally being it, yeah, <laughs> see, having the officer the ability to see um, whether a someone is holding a phone or a weapon, mm -hmm. and that is literally what the difference you can see. So it's it's just an, and and anyone who wants to have the opportunity to come out and see it. I would welcome the ability to do that, but it's it's just an incredible the change in the technology gives officers put makes them safer as well as any citizen or resident interaction they could have. That seems important. Yeah. It is, and I will say we have very limited capabilities right now. And one of the reasons that this came to the forefront for us is we kept running into operations, specifically looking for missing people. Uh, in the woods, things of that nature. We just don't have the equipment for it. And it really kind of startled me as we started this budget process that, that a department of our size wasn't properly outfitted for something as simple as that, finding a citizen in the woods. So this, uh, this goes to help us with that. It also goes, as, as uh, Director Phillips noted, just the officer safety, the de-escalation, the civilian safety. Uh, uh, I was in the military a while ago. I know what the ones look like that used to, and I know what the ones look like now that we're asking for. It is literally night and day, um, just the technology-wise. So this will be a, a great enhancement to our capabilities for missing persons. It will be a great enhancement to our capabilities on critical events uh, so that uh, the folks that are assigned to keep watch, keep civilians safe, and then also de-escalate the situation. They have the pristine view to know, to relay information so that commands can make very smart decisions based on what they're seeing. Thank you for that. Um, and then I think I'm, I know what the answer is going to be here, but I'll ask it anyway, um, that is there an option that makes sense for doing, for having this be in tranches if it was to end up being, uh, you know, part of part of the package being delayed for a year would that impact operations or is there is that something that would be I believe on this particular item, it, there would be an impact if, 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 we, if we were to uh, separate it out or delay it. Um, again, I, it startled me where we are uh, and, and what we could have, and, and for this one I'd say it, it needs to stay together. Um, the rest of mine are base budget questions, so maybe don't mm -hmm. Unless you have other, please finish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, on a roll. All right. Um, so, uh, Looking at now some of the um, other pieces that uh, Mr. Holland had raised in your letter previously to the county executive, um, uh, the county executive has an offer, uh, an office of labor relations uh, that was created in 2019. Um, MCPD has retained uh, your own labor relations officer um, who reports to the chief. Um, is this a redundant position? You know, is this is this a doubling up? Uh, if you could give us some feedback or insights there. So I'll first start with we have two separate unions. Mm -hmm. We have nearly 2,000 employees. Um, and we have a myriad of different union issues um, that, that, yes, we do. It is correct that um, the county executive has started an office of labor relations, but that office is small in nature as well because they oversee the entire county government um, from the perspective under the county executive. Um, I find, again, I will say that um, I understand, you know, that, that, that the union, um, you know, has their opinion about this, but I will say that I think it's in a much needed position for me as the chief of police um, to have someone who has direct um, connections with the Office of Labor Relations to be able to navigate 
um, very important issues and very timely issues that are that we could have a whole discussion about uh, when it comes to labor relations. Um, so my my opinion is that um, the lieutenant that's assigned to our Office of Labor Relations, in conjunction working with our county attorney's office, um, and in conjunction with working with the Office of Labor Relations, which again functionalities which was just established, um, and they're still um, we are still working through logistics um, of of change, and that office is relatively new, and so with that being said, I think. As a result of this, not that they could not ever be revisited, but because of the uh, size of our department and because of, uh, of the multiple roles that uh, my executive officer who works in this uh, as the director of labor relations for the police department, that's very important to me. And for example, we have our own personnel division, but there is an office of human resources for the county as an example. And there's a reason why we have our own personnel division. There are many reasons. Um, and so this is why I would suggest, again, um, understanding that this is why there is a need for us to be, in, to be very efficient as well as to be effective in our communication with our unions. I understand that. Um, you know, I also, most of our, our departments generally don't have a person who is like the one specified person to do labor relations. There's other, there's, you know, members of the administration who, who take that on in their, as part of their various capacities. And as we think about, you know, using officer time and how, and how we're using it, um, you know, this is one of the ones that, that came to mind. I don't know if, if well, this is not an officer that's assigned to the street. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is, this is a, an executive officer. Sure. Okay, so this is not an officer that's assigned to go out and patrol. This is an executive officer that, again, that is having relationships with, um, you know, specific issues that um, the union raises, even at the lowest level. I know there's a lot of things that, that are happening that happen with um, very uh, specific grievances, with other uh, negotiations with labor issues, but there's also managing the contract on a daily basis, working through some of the things at the lowest level. Um, these are things that we are able to resolve um, these issues at the lowest level. Um, so this is why I think it's vitally, one, another reason why I think it's important. Thank you. And this is Rachel Silverman with OMB. Just to give some perspective, I do think, I, I see the concern. I think it is um, common in some of the larger public safety departments that we have, for example, um, fire and rescue does have an assistant chief assigned to labor relations, another comparable size department. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? <clears throat> to create, uh, when they created the office, it has caused a lot of confusion now, when I think it's actually caused a strain on the relationship that we have because we don't know exactly who handles what. And that's the reason why we're saying this is a redundancy and it could be a, a place to find savings. Um, I'm not in favor of either way or whatever. I just think it's you have a labor relations office here, you have it here, and who do you go and who do you talk to for what thing is causing a lot of internal problems. Um, I think it's something we need to address with the executive. I'm not sure whether we should cut out of the budget at this time, but this was a recommendation to the executive because his vision was one labor relations office and we're still having two and we're still not finding where we should be. Uh, I know we've, my other uh, union colleagues have shared the same concerns with the departments they have that have labor as well. We're just trying to find out where we're supposed to report to, who we're supposed to talk to resolve these problems. Thank you. That's helpful. So it sounds like this is a position that, that, that's staying in, but there's some issues that need to be worked out, and I, and I leave that to, to you all and to County Executive Elridge. Um, okay, what is the, uh, the rationale for assigning two captains to work midnight? Um, that started in 2008 as opposed to switching to a staff rotation. If you could tell Accountability, me. <laughs> consistency. And, you know, again, because, uh, and when we say consistency, um, because we have a permanent midnight sh uh, shifts all throughout the county, um, them, they know who the two midnight duty commanders are. They have relationships with them, um, understanding uh, the oversight. They're very aware of all of the significant events that occur or tend to occur during the midnight hours, much of the logistics that occur. Um, this has been a very effective process 
Um, it is something that when years ago when we didn't have two midnight duty commanders, uh, we found that there were significant issues that, that would occur. And I think Chief Manger made that decision probably back at around 2008 uh, or before, um, and it's been, to me, it's been very effective. Uh, my two midnight duty commanders, I have complete confidence um, in them, not that I don't have confidence in my other executives, but again, my other executives, their primary responsibilities are working during the daytime hours. You would then, if you were to eliminate these two positions, you then create a rotation of your existing um, executives to oversee county operations during the midnight hours. Um, and I don't want to put people in that bad situation. And in fact, our, off our, our executives will replace midnight officers. They'll substitute for them when they are, re are on vacation or they need additional leave for whatever reason. Um, but again, um, in worst case scenario, I would say I'm sad to, uh, to bring this up, but the reality is when we did rotating issues before, we had a captain who actually died um, in a car accident um, late in, in working the midnight shift. Um, and it's probably due to, again, uh, overworking during the daytime hours. So I think this is consistent. It's healthier um, for, for our, our executives. Um, and that's why that's why it does exist. Thank you. And if I can point out, Montgomery County is larger than six states population wise. Yeah. Six states. Yeah. And for us to say that we would have one person in charge of the the state of Maryland just doesn't work. It, it, I mean, Montgomery County's. It, so it, I, I believe that we to get into the weeds of of, of every of every. Um, uh, whatever, how everyone is assigned, I don't believe should be a part of this budget. We should be giving the monies to, to do what is necessary, and then the professional staff, along with, with other discussions, should come up with what, what they need to, uh, to deploy, how they need to deploy it. Well, Chair, you'll be pleased to know that I've come to the end <laughs> of, that, <laughs> of that line of questioning. So I uh, look forward to, to continuing the conversation here as we move okay. forward. Did you have anything else? No, there? I'm good. Ms. Frog, are we? Well, I just need to clarify then. Okay. Um, everything is on the high priority items list except, well, the civilian public safety instructors are divided into two tranches of approximately yep. 234,000. Do you want them on the high priority or the regular, regular priority list? Yeah, I, I think it yeah. should be one and one. one if we're going to have one and two one. tranches, okay. I don't know how you'd have them both in the same plane. Okay. And was there any other item that you wanted divided into tranches? As far as I'm concerned, no. I don't know. No, okay. no, no, I didn't have anything else. Um, anything else? I, I mean, yeah. I still have some questions about the officer wellness program and whether we should be waiting on that for further discussion, but I'll, I'll defer to, to you two if you have. But it's so I just want to clarify it's not adding a new thing it, right. it was adding right. a new position right. to an existing program right. is that right okay um, right. the only other thing that I had that we Go talked ahead. about earlier um, was the reduction on the uh, camera rebate piece to yes. allocate over to cover um, BCIC that was my next point I, I had recommended that but I didn't know if you had agreed to that or voted say it again please uh, reducing the security camera rebate program by half for a savings of $255,000 and adding $200,000 to maintain the VCIC through the rest of the FY24. You know, the, the camera program has been dragging on for longer than it should be. And so I, I believe we should keep that where it is. I don't know where everybody else is, but that's what I believe. My preference was to split it just so because I felt like by the time the regulations are finalized and they know what they're how they're going to administer it and get it operable, that we would have enough money to get through the, to the next fiscal year. There would need to be next year, there would still be a continuation of funding in order to get to the full value of it that was initially intended to be placed in it but based on the timing of it, that it would be portion in fiscal year 24 and a portion in fiscal year 25, which would allow that uh, other money to shift over to the VCIC. Go ahead. I mean, I think that, I think that makes sense. 
um, and and uh, shows some effort on our part to make some of these tough decisions. Um, and you know, and we'll end up where we end up, I think, at the reconciliation table. But it opens up the conversation there. Um, so I, I would support that. So it's two one. <laughs> that we should do it that way. Okay. Um, for, real quick on the um, the officer wellness position, if uh, you know, if my colleagues want to move forward with that as high priority, if we could, if it, we could note in the packet for just conversation at reconciliation, um, to loop back to the possibilities of, um, you know, leaning into the EAP and what can be done to um, kind of promote that existing program to our current officers, um, uh, you know, and thinking about it, yeah, just that as a discussion point would be helpful in reconciliation. Good. Thank you. I do think it has to be noted that we talk about a pilot program for drones. Mm -hmm. It just it just doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> that there's a pilot program for drones. But anyhow, thanks. We appreciate you all very, very much and everything you and your officers do. Um, next is the Police Accountability Board. Come on down. Yeah, come on down. How are you? If you would you, Ms. Barry, would you like to identify yourself as we begin, please? Hello. Hello. I'm, how are you? Hi. Good. <laughs> um, Fatma Saberi, I'm the executive director for the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee. Thank you. Ms. Farag, please. Sure. Um, just very briefly, this uh, Police Accountability Board was created last year. It was a state mandate, and the council passed a bill creating nine Police Accountability Board members. There are nine public voting members. One serves as a chair. Um, there is also an administrative charging committee uh, that has five members. And the chair of the PAB also serves as the chair of the administrative charging committee. There are sal various salaries involved for each of the different functions that are conducted on each of those ACCs and the PAB, and including the chair. Um, this, this new budget, FY24 recommended budget, is just to try to right size the PAB. Um, they've had a little bit of experience, and there's some case complaint data uh, listed on page three, but the biggest driver of their caseload is going to be MCPD when the collective bargaining agreement expires June 30th, and they will be subject to um, investigation by the administrative charging committee. I tried to give a little bit of concept about what they might be experiencing, and there's a chart on page four um, showing the past four years of complaints. Now, this is for anything, right? So it could be a, it could be a police officer complaining against another police officer for not switching on body worn video camera or something like that. It may not necessarily involve a member of the community, um, but it, it's the only data that I had that I could provide. Um, Eighty. Um, between 80 and 90 percent of the complaints they get are against sworn officers. Um, so, you know, the total sworn number of complaints is the last column, and that's ranging from a low of 212 up to 405. So that could be, depending on the complexity of the types of complaints they get, it could be a lot of work. The volume could be a lot of work. The members of the PAB and the ACC are part-time, um, committing, committing hours on a part-time basis. At this point, there's one executive director, Ms. Barry. They are also supposed to hire an administrative specialist position, which I believe, did you say that you've, you're extending an offer to somebody? When the process. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, and I'd just like to note that that position is going to be critical too. There's going to be a lot of case management that staff has to do, research, um, formulating issues, helping to clarify stuff for the ACC and the PAB um, as they move forward. 
um, and we really don't know what they're going to experience. So um, I'm just recommending that that the committee and the full council keep an eye on this caseload and the committee may want to bring this back in the early fall to understand exactly what's happening, what type of staffing they may need, if additional or resources, um, case management software, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but it's just, it's still new. Um, this whole new iteration in this year is going to be new for all intents and purposes because they're going to have a much larger case volume. So um, they are supposed to have outside counsel. Yep. The county attorney's office has been trying to advertise for that, but they have not yet had success in filling that position. Um, and the PAB is responsible for appointing a civilian member to the trial board. And the trial board is created by state law as well. And it involves a retired judge of some sort plus a police officer of equal rank to the person um, the complaint has been lodged against, as well as the civilian um, member of the trial board. And I believe you have picked somebody to do that. We have one. Okay, but, you have one. But it's a longer process. Okay. Okay. So, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you, did you finish, Ms. Frog? I, you know, it's only staffing, really. There's a few operating expenses, um, and I'm just recommending placing all of these tax-supported increases on the on the reconciliation list. Actually, these don't get placed. Never mind. I'm sorry. I was writing this this one at like midnight. I apologize. These don't really go on the recommendation list because they are compensation related. So I'm recommending approval. And I think probably and and. You would perhaps know more about this than, than anyone, but we need to probably get an update, not today. I mean, I think we have no idea what, what monies you're going to need, but, but um, I think we would probably be wise to get an update in six months or the committee, whatever, something like that. But what do you think for a time frame for that? Um, I think that makes sense. Um, come July, probably after July, Right, right. Um, because that's when the floodgates we expect to open. Yeah. Um, so far, I've been in the position now for actually <laughs> ninety days. Well, so you've solved everything. You, you've got <laughs> it all done. It yeah. All. You're all done. Yeah. It's yeah. Done. Um, <laughs> so I've been I've been in this position now since um, January 18th, and since that time, um, we've put up the website. Um, well, we've edited the website. We're in the process of changing the website. We put up all the um, social media um, handles. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been pretty successful in getting the message out. Um, I've had great support from um, staff that I met there to um, start off what we have right now. PIO has been great getting the message out, helping me put out the message because obviously it's a you know staff of one for now. Um, and I will honestly say that the process that I've had so far to get to where we are now has has been more seamless than I expected to a certain degree, or that I've heard maybe. <laughs> but I have had a great great support. Um, Tebs has been great. They, they have helped me out a lot on putting things out there because that's really what the PAB is about. Right. It's about putting things out there. They have shown up at our town hall meetings, um, regular meetings to help us streaming out live, um, do the recordings to put them out. Um, and, you know, the, I don't have an SEAA just yet, but we are in the process. Mm -hmm. But, um, Dr. Stoddard has loaned me his, and she has been the most amazing lifesaver. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just had a really great um, experience with help from people like Derek, um, Talia, that's probably just left, or, um, and I, I foresee that we will be able to get done what we need to do with the PAV and the ACC. Um, you know, it's one of those situations where something is created by someone else and they drop it out on your lap and they say fix it and get it done and get it moving. Um, and we are working hard to get everything done appropriately and in a timely manner, and I think we can. Um, um, we don't know what the future holds, but I've had a conversation with Dr. Stoddard and definitely, of course, coming back 
and having conversations about what we need, if anything else, um, is common sense and definitely open to, to making that happen and ensuring that, you know, the, the office is running smoothly. Because the whole purpose is to make sure that the people out there um, have access to this and have a buy-in and understand and law enforcement also understand what the purpose of this is. Are there other counties, uh, have, has anybody gotten further along than we have? I mean, I understand the other counties are smaller so that they... <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the counties that I look at a lot is Anne Arundel County. Yeah. I look at them a lot. Um, yeah. They, um, they're doing, they're doing very, t looking from the outside, they're doing very well um, and, um, and are accessible. Um, Jansen, before he was promoted, like he got the job in the hair promoted. Before he was promoted, he, um, we had conversations on the phone and um, his executive um, assistant that's still there even though he's gone. She's offered to assist, to have conversations. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing because the neighboring counties, I'm sure once the others have also gotten themselves together, we can also have conversations to figure out, you know, the standard because that's all we're all doing right now, right? We're all building, we're all starting from scratch and there is no real roadmap. We're creating the roadmap. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, but there, we're coming along, and I think we're doing pretty well. And we have a great board. We have a great board and a great committee, and they're diligent, they're determined to make the right decisions as far as the ACC is concerned. And um, to be fair, and the PAB, the board members are committed to ensuring that issues that impact the community and law enforcement for them to be able to do their job right, mm -hmm. that those things are paramount for them and they are willing and able to um, get a job done if we give them the resources. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, just a few. I was going to say, since Councilmember Katz was asking about coming back and sharing information from us, so in my head I'm going, okay, so you're going to have July 1st through September 30th. Those are my comments. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. No. July 1st through September 30th, if you could then get something to us by the end of October okay. that covers that I first quarter good. and then the second quarter October 1st through December 31st if you could get something to us by the end of January um, by then you know then you'll have had two quarters worth to sort of see how things are ramping up and what's working and what's not and be able to t tell us what else you might need on our end to, to help make things continue to go as smoothly, I'm knocking on wood, as they have gone so far. Um, because, you know, starting and creating something new and getting it operable and doing the heavy lifting that you've been doing, which is educating the community on what it is and what it is not. Um, I know that's a big challenge uh, in, getting, in getting folks to understand how this works and the bigger, broader scheme of things. and you know, that, that what it is is dictated by state law and how it works is just dictated by state law and then you manage it here locally and that every, you know, every county is trying to do their own thing. And inevitably, as you said, folks are going to get together and talk and figure out what's working, what's good, what's bad, and collectively to say if something really, really isn't working and requires a state law change, well then, you know, you all go to Annapolis and say, this needs fixing. Um, this isn't working as you thought it might have when you first wrote the words on the paper because that, you know, we know that happens, right? Yes. And we have to be able to go back and fix it. Um, and so I know that um, one of the things that it's not, it's not within your realm, but it is tangentially related to, um, you know, at, I would anticipate, like we just talked about the police budget, increased PIA requests happening. Um, and certainly there will be requests coming to you that are copies of or similar to what is going directly to departments in that uh, way. And so I wanted to know, had you thought of any way or thing you might need software-wise in order to track and manage those requests as they come in or what that would mean in terms of handling? Um, not really. Um, probably talk to because as I said, TIPS has been very, very um, 
resourceful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, responsive to our technical needs. So probably just something that we have to look at closer. Yeah, um, and it, it might be something that you could piggyback off of something that yeah, already exists. Already that there. right, but um, that was just something I thought. Oh, if I if I could look in a crystal ball and say what I think might happen yeah. over those first six months of the operability of this once the law changes, that would be um, that would be top of mind in terms of handling incoming um, requests and um, incoming queries and being able to track and flag and. Yeah, we have um, right now online, obviously, people mm -hmm. can go in and do their complaints. Mm -hmm. the system that's sort of in place in, in getting that information okay. to the law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. And we have an internal system right now to track those. Mm -hmm. But again, um, as things progress and change, we are looking into different ways to track and keep those. So they're... Um, we're working internally with TAPS right now to figure out the best way right. that's seamless, that um, um, that meets the security guidelines. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. Because um, everything is confidential. Yeah. And make sure that not only that, but um, it's it's easier. It's easy to to work through. And I'm assuming somewhere in there is figuring out a way to code type of complaint so that you can then pull yeah. the data so that it's queried, queryable or ascertainable by type of event or type of complaint so you're batching when inevitably people are going to come and ask you for data about all the things and then you know you're able to so just as you're getting started up some things to think about but um, no I, I totally appreciate the report that we have and, and agree with it so thank you please Thanks so much for being here. Um, I know that uh, that we are excited to have this entity as a as a part of you know what we do in Montgomery County. Um, it's a little confusing the pad, the ACC, the tri all those pieces. We need um, to straighten that out. Yeah, if I could. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to like run through the flow chart, and if anybody wants to correct me, that would be great. And then for the folks watching, I'm sure there's so many. Um, <laughs> Uh, then hopefully that can either add some clarity or everyone can know that I have got this wrong. Um, okay, so the PAB um, receives complaints from the public. Um, you forward the complaint to the appropriate law enforcement agency, which we're talking about MCPD generally speaking, you know, commonly here. Um, and then let's, well, I'll just talk about MCPD as the entity for this case. Uh, their internal affairs investigates the complaint um, and then the results of their internal affairs investigations, they forward that to the ACC. You sh no, don't getting... just use initials, please. Okay, sorry, so you're right. So the PAB is Police Accountability Board. Yes. Okay. Police Accountability Board, started with the Police Accountability Board, sent to um, the appropriate law enforcement agency. I'll just talk about Montgomery County Police Department and CPD here. Their internal affairs investigates forwards the results to the, oh, God, what is the ACC? Administrative Charging Administrative Committee. You knew I was going to miss that. Okay. To the, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> got it up. Yeah, yeah I you. did too. Yeah. Um, okay, to the Administrative Charging Committee, um, which can then um, either agree with the results of that investigation um, or they can disagree and, and then, you know, charge, and then it goes to the trial board, um, and then things happen from there, but I'll leave that flow chart yeah, floating another. and then the um, the pad not the pad the police accountability, accountability board, board. Yeah. and the police accountability board is then monitoring the administrative charging committee so you providing oversight over the investigations that they are that they are doing the results they are coming up with that and that's kind of a you know a primary role of the police accountability board do I have that Right. So the process is this, the, the Police Accountability Board accepts complaints. Mm -hmm. For us, we have a system online where people do that. And it automatically goes to the law enforcement agency, whichever it is. So it's not just MCPD, we have all the other local jurisdictions from Rockville, Gaithersburg, all the Chevy Chase, all of them mm -hmm. um, come under the purview of the um, ACC. 
So within three days, the Police Accountability Board has to transfer those complaints to the law enforcement agency. At the same time that the Police Accountability Board is receiving these complaints, the law enforcement agencies themselves could also be receiving their own complaints that the PAB does not have. Mm -hmm. So they have those complaints at the same time. The law enforcement agency, whichever it is, whichever of the eight, um, will then do their own investigation through the IAD, Internal Affairs, and they then transfer that file to the ACC, the Administrative Charging Committee. When they transfer it to the ACC, they then review that file and or request more information, request more investigative information to be, to be done. They make the decision and they could either charge or not charge. They can make a determination if the person is culpable or not. They can determine if they decide that the person should be charged, then they look through what's called the matrix and determine through that matrix what the discipline will be. And then they take that and they make that recommendation. They write a report or an opinion and they transfer it to the law enforcement agency, to the complainant, and to the, um, um, law, um, the officer themselves. And all three receive a copy of that opinion. Now, if the law, law enforcement individual decides that they are not happy with whatever the recommendation is, because once it goes to law enforcement agency, the chief, whoever it is, that's the head, will then either um, follow with what the um, ACC has determined as the discipline or raise it. They cannot do any less of the discipline. They can give more, but they have to give that. And once they do that, if the um, um, law enforcement individual, if the officer d does not agree with that, they can then go to and request the trial board. The trial board. Right. Okay. So that doesn't happen automatically. They have to make a request and say, I want to go to the trial board. I don't agree with this. So then they go to the trial board. Whatever happens at the trial board is binding unless, again, they don't agree. If they don't agree, then they go to court. And that's circuit court. Right. why they go to circuit court. And that's the steps, the process. So that's all administrative charging committee. Mm -hmm. The police accountability board, on the other hand, their job is to then take those complaints because every month the law enforcement agencies um, um, communicate to the ACC um, list of complaints to say, we've had 10 complaints this month and this is what happened. So they take that list and they send it to the ACC for, for according to the legislation. The PAB, what they do is they look at trends based on the, the complaints that the ACC is receiving, but it's not every day, right? It's not they get it every day and they look through, not for us anyway, right? Um, and Arundel County, there on the other hand, they get, the PAB gets the complaints. Every time the law enforcement agency receives a complaint, they send it to the PAB within three days. We don't have that in ours. We don't have that in ours, which I think would be good. <laughs> um, we don't have that in our, we don't, we don't, we don't have that in our legislation. Um, and our, our Rhonda does. And so the PAB over there are able to take that and do their review. The PAB here has to wait. till there's a disposition. They, wait. they have to wait until the disposition and everything is done and now it's public and it's no longer confidential and then they can do what they do and make and recommendations um, depending on what the complaints are and how they're being handled because they won't know until the handling has been done, right? So that's how it works. That's sort of the the the, um, the role of each. They are not intertwined in how you know. Sometimes people think they are. They're not intertwined in that sense. The PAB is the PAB, Police Accountability Board, and the Administrative <coughs> Charging Committee. They're separate entities and are all independent of the county. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a county employee and I'm charged with ensuring that they receive the resources and the help and they need to do the job that was mandated by the legislation. Mm -hmm. But they're independent entities that make the decisions that the Ministry of Church and Committee independently and the Police Accountability Board make the recommendations to you, the council, and the county executive, independent of you and the county executive. And the, um, that's really helpful, thank you. The Administrative Charging Committee, um, or sorry, the Police Accountability Board, uh, the PAB is also, so is overseeing the, does the, do they not oversee the ACC at all? Are they only looking at patterns from the complaints or are they doing both of those things? Right. From, from our legislation here in the county, the Police Accountability Board, they're charged with reviewing complaints once they can and looking at trends and make recommendations. Their role is not necessarily to oversee the administrative charging okay. committee. But there's someone entities. from the police accountability board. Right, so the way the, the setup itself is you have nine members of the police accountability board and five members of the administrative charging committee. The chair right now of both the administrative charging committee and the police accountability accountability board is the same individual right. right and the way the law is written is that um, you can have a designee from the police accountability board onto the administrative charging committee so the police accountability board um, also chooses a couple of the members who are on the administrative charging committee so that's how it works that's the engagement and the involvement Got it. with each other Got it. Okay, great. And then, um, so then a couple follow-up questions. Um, so the outside council that we're advertising for, um, that is being advertised as being outside council for the PAB, the Police Accountability Board, as opposed to the ACC, or is it both? Okay, okay, great. Um, and then just wanted to find out more. I know we really want to get that position filled. Do we know where the position has been advertised? Is there anything more that we can do? Is that under the purview of the county attorney? Is he handling or thoughts on, on what would be helpful there? So it's, it, it had been um, advertised before I came on board. And since I've been here, um, I've also assisted the county attorney in getting the word out. Um, getting the information to um, bar associations mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. I think part of, um, part of the confusion I found was that people think that this individual is going to be um, prosecuting um, law enforcement officers and that's not the role. The role is special counsel to advise the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee. Right. For the PAB is basically helping them figure out whether whatever they want to recommend is constitutional, is this something that's allowable on the law, because they are making recommendations on more than likely legislation and changes in policy. The ACC, on the other hand, the Administrative Charging Committee, this individual will be advising them on whether the decision to maybe discipline an officer, does it really fit under this matrix? Can you legally do this? Um, is the charge a proper charge? Should it? So they make, they're advising. They are not going to be the ones to be in court um, prosecuting or um, any sort of reprimand. And even as they give an advice, the dis ultimate decision, just as I give an advice, if you ever see any of our meetings to the PAB, I've given several times advice and they say, yeah, no, mm -hmm. we, no, we don't wanna do that. We wanna do this. So it's their ultimate decision. It's not the whoever the attorney, the counsel will be. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's interested, <laughs> who's a Maryland bar attorney. I was gonna say, I've seen the advertisements multiple times. Mm -hmm. So we're still looking. And it's a great board to work with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will try to think about ways that we can also be helpful in trying to, try to push that word out there. Yeah. Um, 
So one thing that has that has come to mind is that you know if the if the ACC decides to um, you know to to disagree with uh, with a finding of internal affairs, the case or the workload associated with their next steps are. Uh, you know, significantly more, obviously, than if they decide to agree with internal affairs. Um, so that's just one, you know, flag that uh, has, has occurred to me. And one of the things certainly that we're going to want to um, loop back and think about as, as we move forward down the path here. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and additionally, as um, just thinking about how to manage the workload that's going to ramp up after, you know, the end of June, um, and how the ACC is, you know, they're going to have a lot to juggle, um, and um, and even more if they decide to disagree or to potentially disagree or to, you know, how deep they go into the investigation is them taking on, you know, an additional workload. And so that's going to be something that they are going to have to figure out as, you know, part timers. I mean, that, I'm sure that'll be a, um, you know, a tricky balance. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about um, is if it would be prudent to consider adding for um, to the reconciliation discussion uh, a like an investigator position now uh, acknowledging that you know somebody who can make recommendations to the ACC um, areas in which the report um, from the from the from the law enforcement agency um, would benefit from further research, from uh, you know, make recommendations around people that they may want to subpoena for further in, uh, for further inf information. Um, you know, is that something that would seem helpful to you, or that's probably something I wouldn't take back um, to the ACC themselves. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, but again. Our resources are good resources. So, you know, um, uh, uh, as an office, you don't say no to resources, right? Um, because they all will help. And having someone who would look at um, the information obviously would be um, helpful. But again, um, I'll probably take it back to them and bring it up with them and have them sort of have a, a say because they are an ind you know, independent entity. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, go ahead. It, Thank you, Council Members. So we would just, uh, we don't know what the caseload will be so far um, after June and the floodgates open. Uh, I think it's just more prudent to wait uh, six months down the line to see what the caseload actually is. Yeah, I think all resources are good resources as long as we get the right resources. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if that's a right resource at this point. So, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Um, I don't know if you know the answer on the spot or not, but is the executive open to sending over supplemental appropriation if it, it, it becomes very evident very quickly that they need additional resources? Uh, would, the, would the council allow me to uh, respond to that at a sure. later date? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think just good to have on our radar. I know that we're we're going to check in in the fall and moving forward. And I just want to make sure that we don't um, let you end up in too much of a hole uh, that you're playing catch up in, in this in this important role. And maybe maybe the need won't be great, and then we'll be glad we'll be glad that we waited. But I think that's a good point, um, Susan, that you raised there uh, to, to just have that that option on our mind and to flag that with uh, with the county executive. Um, and then the other. Uh, you know, similarly piece that I wanted to flag for us to consider is because this is a new entity and it's, um, and this is new work that's being under, undertaken by other jurisdictions as well, um, you know, the uh, ability to, uh, to attend trainings, to attend um, conferences by relevant organizations, uh, and, um, and and confer with other bodies and other jurisdictions who are also ramping up and having learning curves, I think could have a good return on investment as well. Um, you know, questions like, um, as you raised, Councilmember Ludke, around like what technology is do you need? What's the best thing to you know? Everybody's going to be kind of trying to reinvent their own wheel, and so making sure that you know if we have to you know spend a little bit to send you to a conference somewhere, um, so that you can you know have those conversations with other people who are also doing their research and experimenting. Um, that is another flag that I think we might want to think about on the on the early side that would have a good uh, return on investment and help us to make good decisions moving forward. 
Yeah, I just I did want to clarify or, you know, have you clarify that, you know, because you'd mentioned an investigator position, but the PAB does not perform investigatory right, for functions. ACC. Right. But, you know, I don't know whether that is under current the current status of our county's right. process for that something that would be within the scope of the ACC's duties either into as to how they handle the cases or what process they engage in as they bring it forward. So could you speak to that just a little bit? So the ACC is, um, of course, charged with making determinations. Right. So part of what um, I've already requested from law enforcement agencies is the um, because they received the IED file. Right, right. But they may determine that IED file is not enough, right? Because, right. Yeah. The law enforcement agency does the investigation and provides them with information, and they look through that, that file. Um, and they may say, well, that's not enough. We need more. Mm -hmm. So then they would need to have access to the opportunity to get further information right. that's separate from that investigative file. Right. So the, um, um, the legislation allows them to go further mm -hmm. than just that file. Right. Because otherwise, it's just like saying, this is what you have, and so, mm -hmm. you know. Take it and that's take it. Take it and leave it right. kind of thing. And it doesn't, it, you know, it won't, it doesn't help them. And, and, the, the process, right? Right, but that's the bo the body itself makes that determination and then says, we are directing you to provide this additional information Correct. to us. Correct. And it comes from the body It comes itself. from the body. We yeah. don't have enough. This doesn't tell us enough. Right. We need you to do more, and right. this is what we need. Right. And they lay it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they have that, that authority. Um, but I, I want to also make a clarity um, clarification that um, – Yes, they're getting paid, but it's really a stipend. I know it's paid in yeah. quotes. Right? It's really a stipend, and yeah. and you know I, I don't it's I don't frugal to live right. Yes, this exactly, is not a real salary. it's not part time. Yeah, not even. It's, no, it's not part time. They are volunteers who are getting a certain amount of stipend mm -hmm. to do this, mm -hmm. um, and whether they agree or disagree with what the IED decides upon they still have to review all of the body cameras, yep. which is very time consuming. Yep. They still have to review the entire file and maybe get more information. So the time commitment is still there. Yeah. Regardless of whether they agree or disagree with them, they still right. have a huge workload that they have to work with. They still have to do the same amount of work. Right. And when they're writing their reports that they're in the process right now of writing their opinions, it's not that much more on the ones where, okay, yes, the person mm -hmm. should be charged, or no, we agree they should not be charged, or whatever right. the case may be. Where there's some... Right, right. So, yes, of course, you will need more information, usually if you are going to make that decision and say, I don't agree with this, that, you know, so part of what we've requested from the law enforcement agencies is access to their, um, not just, because when they give the IAD file, the internal affairs file, they give you what they feel and believe is the violation or what it applies to. So what we've requested is that they provide us access to their policy right because the right. the the charging committee may say well i know you said it's section 2.5 but it doesn't look like it it looks more you know right. so they but they have to know that there are other sections and what the other sections say to say okay no we think it's section 3.5 sort of thing so in that respect mm -hmm. they have the authority to go beyond just right. Right. that file so yes but again, um, it's something you have to go back and really see what will be needed. And then, you know, but mm -hmm. I'm glad you're open to. Yep.
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and then to be clear, when I say investigator, I don't mean somebody just doing an independent investigation and bringing the report, of course, you know, to the ACC. They're, they're the ones who are going to be doing the investi investigating actively. Um, I was just saying, you know, as, as a capacity measure, mm -hmm, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, to your point about the tremendous workload with just a small stipend, um, we're asking a lot. And so um, I think checking in very early on um, to see, you know, it, do you need support from somebody who is trained to go through and note, here are some places where you might want to subpoena additional information or request additional information or, or, you know, or whatever you know, the case may be? Um, you know, is that something that would be helpful to make sure that we set you up for success and we want to make sure that the public uh, doesn't start things off by losing faith in this new entity? So, thanks. Okay. Any, are we good or anything else? Nope, so I'm assuming you're recommending approval as submitted? We are. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And then we just have the one last prisoner yeah. medical services one. That's a 10 second item. Mm -hmm. That is just a placeholder of 20,000 in case they have to provide medical care to people who have just been arrested and before they're placed in corrections custody. Yes. I'm, I'm good with a 10 second one. Yeah. Thank you. My <laughs> good. Yes. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for the time um, and for all the recommendations and the questions appreciate thank it. you we appreciate everything you're doing thank you anything else ms frog until tomorrow till tomorrow <laughs> bring snacks yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had lunch today. That was exciting. Yeah. Hmm? So I had lunch today. That was yeah. exciting. We had we had a birthday celebration in my I office. Missed it. 